You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation, old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. Hey guys, Shane from the Vanu Podcast here. I just wanted to do a, a brief introduction to today's episode. Uh, so today you are going to hear uh, the first, I guess the uh, inaugural, I guess the real inaugural episode of our Building the Second Realm series that uh, we did over on Liberty Intact Radio uh, back in uh, the beginning of uh, 2018. So yes, this was January 14th, 2018, uh, the philosophy of the first realm. I'll go ahead and mention first off that if you want to get a, a copy of this uh, this audiobook, Second Round Book on Strategy, for free, uh, please just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash SRAudio. Uh, that is an affiliate link for uh, for Audible, but uh, you can download the book for free. Uh, you get a free 30 day uh, for a free trial, and uh, we get uh, you know we get a cut, so that it uh, doesn't give it doesn't give uh, uh, Amazon any money, uh, and it does help to support us. So please do consider uh, snagging a free copy at libertyunderattack.com forward slash SRAudio. And I'll also mention that uh, if you want to uh, check out that book for free, digital format, along with hashtag Agora and uh, a bunch of other resources, uh, you can find those at libertyunderattack.com forward slash second realm. Um, that is where all of these episodes are. Um, basically just uh, yeah, reposting them on the Vanu podcast uh, podcast feed uh, for redundancy purposes uh, in terms of Vanu. And also it's just really, really valuable content. And uh, especially now, um, especially now with uh, the the importance of organizing uh locally uh, in physical space and time so um a little bit about this episode and, uh, and what we cover to give you a little bit of an idea it is longer every episode kyle and i do uh, is long as hell so this one's uh yes two plus hours i'm pretty sure um but yeah we talk about uh, our introduction to the second realm concept uh we obviously spend uh, a substantial amount of time defining our terms which uh, kyle and i are known to do uh we cover uh Plenty of excerpts from Second Round Book on Strategy, so if you're not sure if you want to uh, grab a copy of it yet, uh, you're going to hear some excerpts from it uh, in this discussion. Uh, we talk about the culture and cultural codes that enforce and justify the statism of the First Realm, uh, and we spend a lot of time talking about culture, because uh, without a culture that reinforces the state, um, it wouldn't matter. It's uh, kind of that uh, that Larkin Rose quote, uh, to badly paraphrase, that, you know, I'm not worried about the Hitlers, because, I mean, yeah. Right. Uh, if there wasn't a culture, if there, a culture of followers to carry out these evil acts, uh, then these people would just be tyrants shouting dictates at the wind. Uh, next, we we covered the important human institutions uh, that were co-opted and are now controlled by the state, uh, and thereby converted into tools to enslave individuals in the first realm. And uh, I guess finally, and this was uh, I guess a little bit of a surprise, um, but uh, we we spend quite a bit of time talking about the monopolies on entertainment, uh, professionally uh, professional sports primarily in this discussion, um, that are co-opted by the state and uh, instead used as propaganda outlets, uh, or I guess in, in some instances founded as that from the very start. Uh, and uh, yeah, not sure how how it is with uh, with professional sports. Uh, we we kind of lay out some hypotheses uh, in this discussion. Uh, for some follow up research that I haven't had uh, haven't had a chance to to follow up on uh, in in a couple of years and uh, might not. Anyway, I think that's all I have for you. Uh, again, second round book on strategy audiobook for free. LibertyAndrewTack dot com forward slash sr audio. If you want to check out the book uh, in digital format with hashtag Agora, LibertyAndrewTack dot com forward slash second realm. And uh, yeah, enjoy. What was your introduction to the uh, concept of the second realm? Okay, it was a little bit of a circuitous path, but in brief, um, as listeners have uh, probably understood for at least a little bit now, I've been off and on working on my federal income tax article, and it's been much more research heavy than when I even did my Right to Travel series, of which you uh, had had me do like a, a three part mini series with you on on LUA, of course. And uh, yeah, part of that was that I was trying to see if agorism was a possible solution to the income tax issue, uh, really, because the income tax is itself a use of lawfare, which is what my next book is all about. So I was looking as a, at agorism as a possible form of pushback. And in so doing, I was looking at all of the published agorist uh, material, uh, some of which is more well-known, some of it not. And when I was looking at more fictional depictions of agorism, obviously J. Neal Shulman's Alongside Night came up, both the novel and uh, the film. But then the only other one that 
popped up was over at a website called anarplex.net, which, of course, was the novella hashtag Agora. And it was through that fictional depiction of the second realm that I also found on as well on on Anarplex, the nonfiction book, uh, the second realm, you know, the book on strategy and so forth. So I was originally working on how do I even explain the federal income tax issue, which eventually led to the second realm. So I guess that would be another approach as a form of pushback, so to speak, against uh, the IRS and their uh, demands that uh, you basically owe a chunk of your life to them. Right, right, yeah, and I, I actually found out about the, the the concept of the second realm through you, uh, you know, through your, uh, as you said, circu- circu- uh, cir- circuitous path. Um, so yeah, I mean, I found found out about it from you, and uh, been doing a lot of research on the subject, and it just so happens that, uh, uh, you know, what Rayo talked about, uh, you know, in, in our episodes over at the Bonnie Podcast, uh, kind of the, uh, the the state of survival society and kind of the one directional isolationism uh, and the Vanu mini cultures. Uh, I mean, Rayo was talking about this quite a while ago. He just had a different name for it. So. Uh, you know, definitely overlap nicely with uh, with other uh, you know topics uh, that uh, that I was covering. Well, I'm 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 glad that you at least found other similar depictions of what very well may be the either the same idea or or a related one. But yeah, kind of the idea of a voluntary uh, segregation of sorts, or another way of putting it would be a new society from within the shell of the old, as some of the other older anarchists would, would kind of phrase it. But yeah, that. so originally I'm still trying to finish my book on lawfare, and as part of that I'm trying to finish my thing on the income tax, but then I learn about all this other stuff that people have suggested as as different forms of, of pushback. You know, some people have the, the voluntary simplicity route where you're just earning so little that – IRS basically and enti- under vis-a-vis Title 26 basically views you as not uh, owing anything because, of course, you can't squeeze blood from a stone, as the adage goes, and so forth. But then, in the attempt to actually try and understand the income tax problem, I come across like 20 million people and all their different uh, forms of of uh, solutions and options, and sometimes even direct action every once in a while. So it was it's fascinating that at some point I really will finish it, you know, you know, barring an act of God or something. But <laughs> but yes, that that's how I found out about the second realm. It was I was working on something else completely different. <laughs> right, right, and uh, I guess to to bring up one thing. Uh, you know, I don't think that uh, that's that phrase uh, building a new society within the shell of the old is actually applicable to the second realm or you know Vanu mini cultures because the idea is to, as far as I understand it, to build a new society outside of and despite, uh, you know the 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 uh, despite the existence of the state of all society. So correct. Um, I don't know. What do you think? I, I I think that's a more accurate way of putting it. So it's it's been interesting for me also in between looking at like law books and case and case law and what the government says about its own laws and all that kind of jazz of which I've just started you know going through that material again and and actually kind of going past where I was before. I finally finished reading the Pollock case. Boy, that thing was a brain twister. Um, but yeah, I um, how do I say this? It's been very fascinating for me to watch different philosophers of different traditions basically trying to explain how either through social engineering or even probably more accurately just through uh, practicing a different set of values how you can basically kind of get away from authoritarianism and some people have the more you know subculture idea like the phrase I I was just mentioned or you just kind of segregate off in in some way Um, which is not entirely a bad route to go. And so, yes, it's kind of fascinating to kind of instead of reform this and reform that and reform, you know, somebody's, you know, pajamas or whatever, you know, let's build something new. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So let's go ahead and uh, get into definitions here. Um, So the first one, obviously, you know, since uh, we're since, you know, the idea is to build the second realm, uh, it's uh, very important to to start here with the basics and and describe what the first realm is, uh, or in this case, uh, you know, the definition. Uh, So from the second realm book on strategy, they say, quote, the interwoven aspects of culture, institutions, profits from redistribution and the longing for stability uh, form the foundation of the power of states and assure lasting consent uh, for this system of domination, end quote. Uh, So that was I mean, it wasn't it wasn't I don't think that was really that was their intention to, you know, lay out a definition there. I think that's a pretty good one. 
Um, but uh, I also think that uh, Rayo's uh, concept of the state of servile society could also fit here. But I guess with that first definition, that uh, smuggler and uh, ABC or XYZ or whatever his, his uh, ch- pseudonym of choice was, um, you know, what do you think about their their definition of the first realm? It's, uh, hmm. I don't know. I think I like Rayo's better, almost in some sense, because it's pretty much. I mean, the servile society was essentially uh, the state plus, you know, the culture that basically upholds the state as as basically a deity, uh, is is at least one way of putting it, I suppose. But yeah, here where they say about the interwoven aspect culture, institutions, profits from redistribution, the longing for stability. Yeah, I mean, it's almost a wordy way of putting it, but I guess for some intelligentsia or or for some uh, certain people that just like wordy uh, definitions, I mean, it's fine. I think maybe a better descriptor, maybe not necessarily a definition, but at least a descriptor of the first realm, I think was actually better explained in, interestingly enough, the novella Hashtag Agora. Uh, the protagonist basically said the following in, in brief, quote, The first realm is ruled by politicians. Personal freedoms are inhibited and restrained. Rather than advocating a revolution, they want to build a second realm, one that is free from the rulers of the first realm. So more and more parts of our lives can be transferred to the second realm until an individual lives mostly free in the second realm while being technically ruled over in the first realm. So technically, the second realm could be described as encrypted communication, encrypted currencies, anonymous and pseudonymous identity, untraceable action. So, for instance, someone could be their usual self in the first realm, pay some taxes, pretend to have a normal job and be an ordinary citizen. In the second realm, you could be free, more or less, close quote. So maybe that's a slightly uh, better way of putting it is really kind of just drawing a distinction, you know, between the two. In that, you know, lawyers and their laws and all the stuff that my next book is about, I'm basically describing the backbone of the first realm. And it's kind of also an interesting question, too. You know, did did culture create the state or did the state create the current culture as it is? It's almost a chicken to the egg issue. I know some people have their <laughs> have their judgments going one particular way, and I more or less disagree with that, but <laughs> Because, I mean, think about not to bring in old man Rayo for the 20 millionth time, but think about what he said regarding the relationship between government and and culture more generally, you know, in that, uh, to more or less paraphrase, given enough time, enough statism, enough coercion that's monopolized and worse legitimized by by government, uh, the culture itself will start changing forming around the norms that the state has imposed upon its hapless subjects, which was more or less it was kind of getting at. So when you look at the first realm, I guess I guess in a lot of ways it is the state plus the culture and maybe even more things like the psychology of authoritarianism and so forth, where it's even how people approach problems like, oh, there's this problem in the world. Let's use coercion and then you and then paper it over with a lot of flowery rhetoric. And then people will get on our side and agree with us that this monopoly on coercion, for example, passed a new law that demonized this particular batch of people and and, um, you know, basically legit minimizes coercion so you know how dare you collect rainwater kind of thing or whatever the issue at play happens to be right right so so as far as uh you know a definition this is one that uh, we came up with uh for the uh, vonnie podcast uh but obviously it is the the idea that radio put forth uh so uh, as i said uh, the first realm can also be described as the state of servile society which uh, is defined as, quote, a society that does not respect self-ownership or individual liberty, but rather heralds the supremacy of government and authority. In other words, it upholds the collect best superior to the individual. A one-directional isolation of import-export is used to maintain access to these servile societies' open but not free trading centers, yet denying them access to a Venuans' home through importing goods and knowledge while exporting labor or products back out to the servile society, uh, end quote. So, as far as the one-directional isolation uh, and the import-export, uh, there is an element of that with the uh, the second realm. It's uh, almost synonymous uh, as far as uh, as far as I see it. But that will be a a future episode. Um, but but yeah, I mean that is a, a great description of the first realm. Uh, no res- no respect for self ownership and uh, the c- uh, collective over uh, the individual. Uh, so so yeah, I think that's a, a pretty uh, pretty good way to explain the first realm. Yeah, there, there's also one other thing, too. The reason for either like something like a Vanu 
home or shelter, Vanu Association, or as is the case here, a second realm, is because there's an insistence that people have now been making, thankfully, that there need to be private property borders between, at the risk of using collective pronouns, between our culture versus the servile society slash first realm. You know, uh, because because they're a monopoly, right? They're a ubiquitous monopoly, and they use coercion and they legitimize the coercion of whatever it is, whether it's through law, whether it's through democide, whether whether it's even through through other means where they manipulate people through prop through corporate propaganda usually, or even state sponsored propaganda. Um, I would just kind of say this: the first realm essentially imagines itself to be God. Uh, you know, omnipotent, seeing, all knowing. I mean, that's why they insist on the surveillance state and the development of technologies, just to use one type of example. So the first realm essentially imagines itself to be God, and those of us who would prefer a second realm are essentially saying, the boss of me, we're just going to go build something else, I guess would be a more vernacular way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So. Uh, obviously, this episode will be focused on the philosophy of the first realm, but uh, it's I think it's, uh, I guess, as far as comparing and contrasting goes, uh, define uh, actually what the second realm is, too. So um, from uh, actually, this is a definition also taken from uh, from the Vani podcast, uh, quote, an updated version of Timberg Autonomous Zones, Taz's. Essentially, the ability to conduct trade and other activities, including vices, in certain areas at particular times without reprisal from the state. Tazes were originally conceived of as geographically mobile, like Vanu shelters, yet now it may include uh, cyberspace, such as the deep web, uh, end quote. So, uh, again, the, the idea is to, uh, you know, I guess, uh, segregate from the first realm and, uh, you know, start a, a new free society, uh, one that uh, would, would likely be mobile. I think it's kind of a requirement. But, uh, you know, actually living free, doing what you want to do with your own body, exercising your autonomy – um, and, uh, actually, you know, living free. Yes. And sorry, something I just thought of that might help flesh out this, this definition. I don't think it would be untoward of me to say that if you were to combine the elements of agorism and even Vanuism, you would get a second realm because I mean, think about the comp, think about the points of commonality. You know, the Agoras have the counter economy. That's your black, gray and black markets. And then, of course, the Venuans have their ethical enclaves, which, of course, are, well, gray and black markets. So different terms are the same thing, more or less. And I guess the second realm would be your, your, I guess, maybe more crystallized version of the same concept. But it kind of goes beyond both in its focus on private property borders that – you know, such and such belongs to the first realm, but this other stuff belongs to the second realm, and clearly delineating, you know, what belongs where. So it's almost like a private property version of um, what the lawyers would call property acquisition and titling, the titling being the important part, and not necessarily in the mainstream first realm concept of the you know, land titles and or deeds and all that, but more in the sense of just it's, – it's, it's almost – Getting closer to like argumentation ethics, where it's kind of self-evident, you know, uh, the, you know, the property is owned by, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, you know, for example, uh, the shirt on your back is yours, and the baseball cap on my head is mine, kind of thing. Uh, that's that's kind of the impression I kind of get from this is that there's very much a more specific focus on maintaining private property borders. But so even the notion of like so-called public property, which of course is its own weird oxymoronic horrific concept that of course invites a tragedy of the commons all by itself for many, 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 many reasons, not just economic. The, the whole notion of a second realm is essentially a microcosm, fully privatized um, – you could even say law, uh, private property, you know, law society in a manner of speaking. Law in the sense that everything is privatized. Even even the use of law is privatized. I mean, you know, if a, a third Austrian economist catchphrase was privatize everything, I mean that, that would essentially be the second realm 
uh, as it is today, to, you know, to the extent that it can yeah. be. And the, and the big thing is, is enforcing those borders. So in, in other words, you know, the bludgies can't really get into the second realm, or even if they tried, uh, the bor- the borders, or shall we say the security precautions the borders that the- be defended, mm-hmm. at least oh, in some sense, be a wall. Well, well, that maybe that's one way of putting it. But, you know, even if the second realm was more amorphous, which hence why the definition is an updated version of Taz's. Well, Taz's by definition themselves as a definition, they're more amorphous. They they're not like a fixed location. You see, the problem with permanent autonomous zones or passes is that they are a certain specific piece of geography from this latitude and longitude to that latitude and longitude. And so they are vulnerable to coercion by the state or by the first realm. Tazes, on the other hand, are much more flexible and can occupy physical spaces, but not always. So the second realm, basically as a concept, is already more elusive, is more elusive to being captured. And I would suggest that if it's done right, it's actually impossible to, quote unquote, catch it. The only thing that really it can do is is a exist at all. And B, you know, if people want it, they can grow it. But it takes humans to actually resist the first realm or shall I say, build the second realm to actually grow it in any real sense, much like ethical enclaves, much like the counter economy. Uh, the second realm requires folks who actually are serious about at least their economic liberty, if nothing else. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So another very crucial, uh, uh, crucial definition uh, brought up in uh, second realm, the book on strategy, uh, which is no surprise to libertarians and uh, and, and anarchists, is uh, individual autonomy. And uh, I do think it's important to, to I guess, uh, you know, read a read a quote here uh, that they put in the book. Uh, so they say the foundation for liberty is small is a small but powerful word, autonomy. It comes from the Greek words uh, autos meaning uh, autos meaning self and nomos meaning law. It refers to the ability, right, or wish of something to be governed by its own law. Anarchism is therefore not what the media tells us, but instead the presence of law chosen by those that are covered by the law, contrary to a law given by rulers to handle subjects. Uh, Moving forward just a a little bit here. uh, That each and every person has the right, uh, that is morally justified, to be the final authority over the law he chooses for himself, and that anything that violates this right is a crime, end quote. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess, uh, um, yeah, I, I, individual autonomy is certainly important. I mean, that's kind of uh, uh, the origins of private property, right? You own yourself, and uh, then, you know, to, uh, as an extension, you own the fruits of your labor, uh, which is why, uh, you know, tradecraft and uh, trade is super, super important. It's a very, very, very critical aspect of uh, the second realm because economic liberty, I mean, uh, that's a pretty, pretty crucial one. Well, yeah, of course, because if someone is against private property, they are anti-propertarian, which is an actual, you know, uh, uh, intellectual tradition, unfortunately. If someone is an anti-propertarian, then they're contradicting themselves. If, if anybody who understands argument, you know, Hans Hermann Hoppe's argumentation ethics does, is that even in the very act of arguing against private property, you have to use the private property of, shall we say, yourself, your self-ownership, to basically contradict yourself. And so it's, you know, there no refutation is required. It's already self-refuting. This is why, for example, socialism is automatically self-refuting because the socialists in question contradict themselves when they advocate for socialism. Um, this isn't kind of hard to figure out. Um, so it's so, yeah, the whole notion of autonomy and and specifically individual autonomy is also consistent with like the American tradition of of anarchism. So this comes from like Lysander Spooner, from Benjamin Tucker, and a couple of others. And even in and not to confuse the issue too much, but even in some of their older writings, uh, sometimes they'll they'll mention like socialism or whatever. Uh, that's kind of a misnomer. What they were really talking about were markets, because they were basically trying to find words to describe. Um, uh, fascism and other forms of authoritarianism, and they hadn't, qu- and and <laughs> and of course the commies were already around, uh, so they were trying to find some other word to use. So it's it's better to focus on markets and autonomy because that kind of explains 
the 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 level of well for lack of a better term the lack of freedom that entrepreneurs have and of course if entrepreneurs have their freedom to trade and to innovate and so forth then by extension you would assume that there would also be other types of freedoms, whether it's uh, the freedom of association, like for more social situations, not connected with uh, business ventures, um, you know, free speech, right to keep and bear arms, as you know, as certain legal documents would would phrase it, and and so forth. So the you know the the right of the freedom of man in his purse or his wallet, so to speak, could be viewed as one foundational pillar of, of human freedom or, or shall we say individual autonomy more generally. So if an individual autonomy is denied, then the only other thing left is the collective. And it's like, well, if we're dealing only with collectives at this point, then we're right back to the first realm. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so, so I guess that kind of uh, you know that's kind of uh, you know the first realm and second realm uh, defined and uh, differentiated. So, uh, what I'd like to do now, Kyle, is uh, uh, I guess dis discuss some of the elements of the first realm. And uh, again, in the second realm book on strategy, which I, I would highly recommend uh, everyone read, we're going to cover uh, probably most of it, uh, you know, in this uh, in these next nine episodes, but. Uh, it's, uh, it's only about 36 pages. It's a pretty quick read. You can sit down and do it in a couple hours. Uh, or if you want to, you know, really, really, really dig into it, uh, a few hours, a few hours at least. Um, but yeah, very short read. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start, uh, I guess digging into it, uh, right now. So, uh, quote, we have already concluded that our objectives are opposed by a majority of the population as well as the ruling class. It is, however, necessary to analyze these specific methods by which our object objectives are opposed and which means are employed to keep us from reaching our goals. Humans are spatial, social, and cooperative beings. We occupy space that no other spatial thing can occupy at the same time. Our bodies need to be somewhere. They need to be sustained. We are also social because we require interaction with other humans. We want to communicate. We want to learn from each other. We want to procreate. Well, while we are the only thing in the space we occupy, we also need to interact, be viewed, and view other humans around us. We define and achieve social status through interaction and observation and use it and use it to find out how to prevent conflict, to solve conflict when it occurs, to create institutions of interaction and symbols to identify friends and foes, and to optimize our communication. Since we also live in a scarce world and cannot do every necessary thing alone, we also engage in cooperation, specialization, and trade. These characteristics of human life constitute the frame for most things we do, but also provide the means for our opponents to keep us in chains. Throughout history, those that opposed liberty have developed and cultivated a complex and refined science on how to keep populations under control. We are not referring to a secretive group of social planners, but a set of techniques that are shared not only by the rulers, but by those parts of a society that profit from coercion and the com comfort it brings. To understand this science, it is beneficial to look at our, how our various aspects, spatial, social, and cooperative, are exploited. It is necessary to understand that the state and the systems of the world are not spatial. Though the state claims ge geographic control, the state itself cannot, cannot occupy any of it since, it since it is not a physical entity. It is a social concept of control. The only way the state can interact with the spatial is through its agents and proponents, as well as anyone conditioned to represent or call for it. It is individual humans that must intrude into another individual's space to deliver any kind of force, whether it be direct or indirect. When not applying force, the only other option for the state to act within space is through its agents to observe or surveil the space uh, of others. End quote. So that's kind of the, the first portion uh, of the <clears throat> obstacles portion. And, uh, you know, I definitely uh, I, I think they're. Uh, they lay out uh, some important stuff there, but what do you think? Yeah, that latter portion is actually very revealing. So there's a couple things going on. First is the the authors more or less explicitly state that the government, that the state does not exist. You know, existentially, it does not exist. So when you either have political philosophers and or people like us talk about the state, you know, the state did this or the government did that – we're using that as a form of linguistic shorthand to basically describe a set of relationships or maybe perhaps more a little bit more accurately a sort of hierarchy that has a definable set of uh, char of characteristics and features so when we talk about the government to this the government to that we might be talking about the police or we might be talking about uh, lawyers and prosecutors or we might be talking about judges we might be talking about legislators and or bureaucrats and so on and so forth so yeah 
yes, they're right when they say it's a social concept of control. And the other key part of it, and this is where the individual, <laughs> this is where the uh, individual, uh, uh, let's say, an abuse of individual autonomy comes into play. The state can only interact with spatials through its agents and proponents. So even when the minarchists, the people in favor of limited government, talk about government agents in general, they're cl- they're getting closer to something real that's actually happening. Because the state or government cannot – it's not like one monolithic entity in the sense like it's one person or as a side note, the closest it ever came was monarchy, which would be like the king or queen It is the state. They toss same moi, right? Uh, that would be like the closest thing. But then even in, a, uh, <laughs> even in a monarchical form of government, you still have the king's guards. You have the king's court, which were the courtiers and such. You had magistrates. You had all these other agents of the king, of the queen, of the monarch, the sovereign, uh, who would basically carry out uh, the will of, of, the, uh, <laughs> of the monarch and all that. So even then, the state wasn't even necess- – in practical terms, maybe not in terms of definitions, but even – In the closest example of the state being one individual, you still had all these other people part of the government that actually had to be there and functionally were required in order for the monarch to retain and use the coercive power of what we refer to as the coercive power of the state. He would need – in other words, he would need the magistrates and the bureaucrats – even the bureaucrats, yes, even even a monarch is form of government. You would need the bureaucrats and the king's guards and the soldiers – almost forgot about them – and and a whole bunch of other people to even make a monarchy work. Never mind expand it or 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 maybe even shrink the that that particular form of government. So yes, even with something close to – even with this form of the state, where it is really one person, sort of, it's they're more like a titular head or like a key focal point. You still have all these other agents. And obviously for other forms of government, not predicated on one individual, such as an oligarchy ruled by the few, democracy ruled by the many, a republic which is ruled by, I guess, special interests, I suppose. Um, actually, you could <laughs> say that about democracy, too, because they all start blending after a while. Um, yeah. Though, again, it's it's the state only interacts with you through its agents. So, for instance, in our particular time period, 21st century America, with these uh, various several American democratic republics, when any of us interact with uh, the state, whether it take the form of these provincial governments, these municipal governments, these county governments, or even the feds, the national government, um, yeah, we, we only deal with the agents thereof, Right. And I've done on previous episodes and, and other podcasts, I've mentioned about my interactions with like the voter registrar or, uh, pe- you know, certain people from the, the courts or whatever, usually court clerks. Um, those are agents. So not and not. And here's the key thing. Not any one of them actually is the state. They're just agents of the state because the state doesn't exist. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I I think just uh, kind of setting up the stage here for the obstacles, I think that was uh, uh, an important portion. Uh, and also your, uh, you know, very well said on on, on kind of, uh, you know, further elaborating on that. But uh, let's get to the first um, major thing uh, that uh, that smuggler and uh, X Y Z discuss here. Quote. Cultural norms of the mainstream society and most of its subcultures reward pro-state behavior while they punish non-state behavior. Well, this is not yet true for all parts of the cultural code. It is increasing, often without us noticing it. There are numerous examples of this. The, the method most often, su- often suggested for problem solving is to call the police, to always obey the state authority, to use convenient methods of payment, credit cards, etc., to make every payment an official le- legal tender, national currency, get a good job, petition your representatives, work within the system, pay your fair share of taxes, adhere to the current definition of political correctness, or simply to not make trouble. All of these codes of, of conduct focus on a single goal, to integrate into a society that is led, organized, and enabled by the state. Alternative views are quickly labeled a waste of time, not practical, unrealistic, utopian, eccentric, or even treasonous. Interwoven with these codes are values that most people are accustomed to use when judging their neighbors. While many soldiers today partake in wars that should, not, that should realistically be called unjust and therefore a crime, they are not met with disgust for choosing this career. Policemen that enforce unethical laws, often with unethical methods, are not excluded from our, co- our comradeship, but instead called our finest. 
tax collectors that objectively conduct armed robbery are not called out to be justified or as are not called out but identified as doing their job in the end uh, do, or as doing their job in the end everyone is just following orders we'll do uh, uh, just a, a few more paragraphs here and then we'll discuss quote in addition a wide variety of symbols are used to identify people as being respectable some of these are styles of clothing status symbols licenses membership cards use of language and laughing at the right time Together, these codes, values, and symbols form societal expectations and identities, the function of culture, and any fundamental variation from them is met with rejection or even outright hostility. It is very important to understand that these codes, values, and symbols are highly interconnected and form an integrated body of culture, which makes it very hard to successfully break out of this scheme. If we change only parts of it, it is easy to be dragged back into the old ways by many parts that are still tied to the larger culture. Ideally, this need not be so, but as a practical matter, it usually is, end quote. So, Kyle, that first thing, and uh, this is very, very true. I mean, uh, you know, Rayo talked about it, the state is servile society. I mean, this is, that is the, the culture of statism, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, I, I certainly think that, that the culture uh, is uh, <laughs> is definitely, definitely the, a major aspect of this, the symbols, the codes, um, uh, the norms, all of those things, the, uh, the, the propaganda and indoctrination to, uh, to worship authority. And, uh, I mean, yeah, any digression from that is, uh, definitely, I mean, I, I know I've heard this a bunch of times, but, uh, when I've, you know, even discussed just things like direct action, uh, or, you know, Vanu, I mean, uh, yeah, waste of time. Now, I've heard that before. Uh, not practical. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Those pragmatist political crusaders, uh, unrealistic, uh, you know, no one can, or you know, I can't. I just can't do that. That's super unrealistic. I mean, I can't, you know, pursue financial independent early retirement. I'm gonna work until I'm 65, and then I'm gonna draw on Social Security. I mean, that's that's realistic. Uh, utopian, uh, sure for that one. Eccentric or even treasonous. Yeah, treasonous. Uh, you know, uh, I haven't heard that personally with any of these methods, but uh, you know, with uh, with the last episode with uh, with Ben Stone, the Bad Quaker, I'm sure that could be labeled as uh, as as, uh, as treason. So uh, yeah, culture is definitely an important aspect. Uh, it's, it's, it's that, uh, that propagation of, uh, you know, the state doesn't have to use violence against its subjects all the time, right? Um, because you know, who, uh, you know, does their violence for them, their followers, uh, the culture, uh, the slave on slave violence, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that does end up, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, it's that slave on slave violence, uh, and that's propagated by culture. So I think they make a really good point here. I think that's probably the number one, uh, I guess the, the number one, uh, obstacle, uh, in building the first realm, not only do you have to avoid the state, uh, but you also have to practice very good security culture when you're around, uh, uh, you know, folks that uh, that are, I guess that that accept the state of survival society. Because uh, if you if you're doing something outside uh, outside the realm or outside or doing something they don't like, uh, well, they can just call the bludgies, and that's not uh, good for anybody. So, uh, what do you think? I think this would be a great time to for me to mention, and I've been kind of holding my tongue on this, but I think I mentioned this to you pre-show. I think I think the other night when we were working on something else, uh, the uh, <laughs> there's that particular coworker of mine who who shall go unnamed, but he's more a middle-aged fella, and he is very cranky and such. And during while we were working at the warehouse, what was fascinating was. When we got into more political discussions, he was more political. I, of course, am anti-political, which he didn't like even that. But that's kind of how how dare you not vote in our democracy, I think, was one phrase that he used to kind of admonish me. I'm in need of admonishment. That was kind of the other thing, because, of course, he's incredibly condescending, was the fact that he that FDR was like his uh, the best president ever that he rescued uh, capitalism by merging it with some socialist aspects and thus brought, you know, America out of the great depression. And also social security is wonderful because of course he's, he's going to be drawing on it soon. So when I had a second to get a word in edgewise, um, that there is nothing, I even, I was making more limited government arguments in the sense that, uh, well, social security is not mentioned in the constitution, therefore it's unconstitutional. I was also about to mention other historical points like, well, you know, FDR, that guy you like, he, uh, had that court packing plan thing where basically he strong armed the Supreme court in an unconstitutional way to pass the unconstitutional social security stuff that, but did I forget to say it was unconstitutional? And even when I said unconstitutional, he didn't know what the hell I was talking about. That's kind of sad. You know, I'm not that much younger than he is, at least in some sense. 
And uh, yeah, so if I were to say anything else other than that, uh, I don't know. He might recommend me for uh, you know targeting by DHS or something because yeah, I'm my, uttering my disloyal report statements. Sheet, my report sheet to the supervisors or something. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. there's certainly that's. Uh, I think that's one reason why in, uh, in the jobs I've had, I, I keep my uh, my anti political views and uh, uh, you know my work separate because uh, it's not it's not worth losing a job over. Uh, it's, uh, it's just not worth it. I mean, that would set me back, uh, uh, would have set me back, uh, you know, pretty far back in my pursuit of financial independent early retirement. So, uh, yeah. but yeah, I mean, uh, and that, that's, and that's kind of another related reason, isn't it? Uh, no, I guess maybe fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you view it, my, I've been kind of asking around, like, has my current employer ever fired anybody over anything? Apparently, they don't even fire people over incompetency. So, and considering also some of the lower management actually have call have basically said that I'm a specialist of sorts because I'm like a way above average competent than the others, which I guess is a compliment. Then I guess I have the closest thing to a form of job security, maybe. But um, but all of that aside. Um, I actually try doing something a little bit different work where I'm not doing the gray man thing like I usually do. I don't obviously say everything, and uh, but I but I do say things like, yeah, I'm interested in abolishing government, and that's pretty much the closest I get to saying anything even slightly controversial. And even saying just that is way the hell too much. But then with some other coworkers, other conversations we have, I sound more like a limited government guy where I say, well, the government doesn't obey the Constitution, therefore their laws are illegitimate. I'm basically mentioning stuff that I've either written before or stuff that's going in my upcoming book on lawfare. And even for them, the whole notion of a limited government thing is like way, that's way too much freedom. That's that's way too, that's extreme. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, so that's Fucking kind of the crazy. whole, right. And that too is evocative of the first realm. Where anybody who is outside that left-right paradigm, you know, authoritarianism flavor A and authoritarianism flavor B, anybody who's outside of that, it doesn't matter if they're in favor of limited government or no government or various versions uh, and themes thereof. They're 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 way too far out. How dare you invoke the founders kind of thing? Uh, or or even yeah. or even other people who are more along the lines of abolishing government, <laughs> like Sanders Spooner. You know, it's just like that's way too much. Can't I mean I even tried in one conversation working in Henry Thoreau, whom you'd think would be the most palatable, I guess, role historical role model that even people in the mainstream first realm like tacitly kind of acquiesce to because of course his influence on Gandhi and Gandhi is of course like the big one of the big mainstream folk heroes or whatever. Uh no, apparently Henry Thoreau, as one coworker put it, was that how did he phrase it? That eccentric loner in the in his in his cabin home or some or in his cabin. And I'm like, holy yeah. God. So not only did that one guy actually know about Thoreau, but actually viewed him as kind of distasteful. So that's how and here's the other thing about the first realm and the people who subscribe the cultural norms thereof. There is so much projection. You were mentioning this a moment ago about how uh, anybody who basically contests anything of the first realm or even just suggests other things that run counter to it, uh, the normal rebuttal is, "Oh, it's utopian extreme," and that's even in the in the book here and all that. Um, yeah, they're just projecting because it's political crusading. That's utopian. It's all the stuff that they promote. It's their social security. It's all this horrible, evil crap that they do, which is unrealistic and and not pragmatic and so forth. And so what I think is happening is a form of jealousy. When you have people outside the mainstream or even people who are just kind of creative or, or trying to get any notion of freedom or liberty in their own lives, basically postulate different things. I mean, even people who use cryptocurrencies are I was even mentioning Bitcoin in another conversation at work, and people were like, "Why would why would you want to go off the dollar? It's wonderful. I mean, it's just I mean, it's so far gone. It's so easy to buy on Amazon with a credit card. Why would you? Yeah, why would you? But but yeah, I mean, and this is why I've, I've brought this up once in another podcast. I want to start bringing up bringing it up a lot more, but especially in regards to the state of survival society or the first realm as as kind of the subject for this evening. Uh, there's a lot of talk. I mean, this is kind of a uh, a shared view of the West uh, or of, of Westerners, generally speaking, is that uh, you know Western culture is far superior to to any other culture uh, you know uh, in the world uh, with any you know, with any other country uh, or nation. 
And, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I, you know, I probably won't trigger any folks here, but, uh, you know, Western culture fucking sucks, just like Eastern culture, just like any culture with a state. Um, it's all awful in comparisons, you know, comparing, you know, you know, uh, well, the United States is, uh, you know, a lot better than, uh, uh, than Somalia. Um, okay. You know, you, you're, you're, all you're doing right now is comparing plantation to plantation. Uh, oh, did you get, uh, you know, did you get, um, uh, did you get, uh, beaten 10 times a day instead of five times instead of 10? Well, you're doing good. Uh, you know, the, the rulers are benevolent and they treated you good today. Um, there's no, there's no such thing as a, a good state of serve all society. There's no such thing as a, as a good first realm. Um, there's just not. Uh, so in regards to culture, yeah, Western culture sucks, just like any other culture with a state. Right, and but 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 keep in mind of the people within the first realm, that is their only frame of reference. That's all they've ever known. In many ways, they almost remind me of the typical uh, citizenry that you'd find in. Um, Orwell's fiction, like like 1984, it's almost like the average citizen of Oceania, right? Where oh well, Big Brother has always been around, and kind of thing. You know, Oceania is a war with East Asia. Oceania has always been at war with East Asia, at least until next week when Oceania has is at war with Eurasia. Oceania has always been at war with Eurasia until they switch it back again. But it, that's that's kind of my point here: is the frame of reference is incredibly narrow of the hapless citizenry or even enthusiastic citizenry that is within that first realm where basically the rulers can do no wrong and whatever conflicts there very well may be, the conflicts are pretty much limited only to differing class special interests, right? That is, this is basically the authoritarian left and the totalitarian right. They're basically fundamentally the same. What's more important than their superficial, uh, <laughs> their superficial, differences are actually their fundamental similarities that's what's actually more important because right and, and if you if you if you compare i'm like use somalia as, as, as example here because you know scott's uh, you know enlightened me last night i've heard i've heard a lot of anarchists talk about somalia uh and how uh you know it's uh, it's not anarchism um but uh you know apparently there was an anarchist period from like uh you know like 1996 to 2001 and things were you know, very good you know their their economy was booming and all of that and then uh you know in like 2001 or 2002 um, the United States government started, uh, started, uh, you know, causing havoc. So, uh, you know, the, the chaos happening in Somalia right now, uh, you know, uh, it's not because it's anarchy. It's because, uh, they're being, uh, you know, attacked by the, uh, most powerful military in the world right now. So, but yeah, when you look at the, the fundamental, I mean, the, the fundamental similarities, I mean, there, there, there really aren't too many differences. One may be a little, a little more chaotic, uh, than, than other at first, than the other at first glance. But if you look at the, 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 the fundamentals, of uh, you know uh, um, you know Middle Eastern culture, uh, you know Eastern Asia culture, Europe European culture, uh, and then kind of like the United States, the similarities or similarities are all there, right? You have uh, this this massive uh, the, you have this nation state, and you have this uh, this massive government that spies on everybody. You have uh, this massive government uh, that's involved in wars. And uh, you know they ruthlessly murder innocent people. Um, the very the, the fundamental aspect, you know, the use of uh, force and coercion, that's all there. That's all there. So anything beyond that, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it's it's it really doesn't make a difference to me, right? Um, mm -hmm. The the similarities are far too far too tragic, and uh, it also uh, you know violating personal autonomy at every single step. So for 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 those that uh, you know praise Western culture. <laughs> Oh boy, yeah, yeah. You've got some, you've got some, uh, some reflection to do. I recommend, uh, you know, uh, studying the trivia method a little bit. But uh, well, what do you think? Well, yeah, and and not only that, but I, I find it fascinating that the apologist for Western civilization, such as it is, and its good, bad, and indifferent characteristics, are very quick, very quick. I've noticed to always mention that. Well. Uh, Western society, whatever the hell that means, because they're there, because if you look at the real history of different European, uh, empires, uh, and then how they formed to their current nation state structures, oh, the, the Western society is, is a much kinder form of, uh, coercion. And then they'll list like 20,000 different examples relative to various, you know, whether it's far, uh, East Asian, uh, cultures or or even just other places other times as you know whether it be like certain parts of africa or uh south america or even other places and i find it fascinating it's like okay so so basically that's that's your big argument um like for example without getting too graphically detailed here 
I remember there was somebody who was kind of meant that this wasn't at work. This was a more social situation, but the context of it was basically the, um, how women were kind of treated like, like, like property, like trash. And so in the West, how it was done was with various different means, but one of which was like the chastity belt, even for married women and all that to make sure that they stayed faithful to their husbands. Of course, that wasn't reciprocated. But then again, it also depended what class structure you were in, because sometimes the men were faithful and sometimes they weren't. But generally speaking, there would be like the chastity belts. Well, that's much better that form of coercion is much better than the coercion that was practiced by different African peoples where they would hack off different parts of the genitalia and then, of course, sew up the woman until her married, married night and all that. So therefore, the Western society is superior to the African society, so the uh, first realmers claim. Because this form of coercion, the chastity belt, is preferable, you know, against women, is preferable against the lopping off of genitalia and the sewing up of other parts of genitalia uh, than that that the supposedly that some Afri Africans did. And I'm just sitting here at the sideline saying this is almost kind of like when the left and the right kind of make excuses too about when they do their horrible crap, like oh well this version of coercion is better than the other. Or kind of like even when it comes to something like taxes, right? I mean, so the left is usually very much in favor of very high taxes. They're definitely in favor of the federal income tax I've been preparing my uh, my article on. They're very much it – was, it was actually originally a tax the rich scheme. But then, of course, when you look at the right who allegedly are against taxation, well, actually, they're not really against taxation in principle. They just want lower taxes and cuddly taxes, therefore vote for the Republic, uh, Republicrat Party. And I'm just like, but wait a minute. <laughs> I thought you were supposed to be different from the leftists who very much love their taxes. Oh, no, you want – remember remember Glenn Beck many years ago when he was in favor of like a VAT tax specifically? I mean it was just kind of like but, – but, I don't. I didn't know that, but I'm not really surprised. Oh, he was uh, – That this is a little bit more of a side note. But yeah, he was in favor of value of the so-called value-added taxes. The reason I'm mentioning any of this is I'm trying to point out the controlled schizophrenia of the first realmers themselves – where they're not actually opposing – where these different class special interests are not actually opposing each other on anything based on principles of any kind. It's all based on preference. That's what it is. And if you also – interestingly enough, just for an interesting comparison, look at the so-called moderates. The moderates are like the most lukewarm people on the planet who will bend and shift with whichever way the winds of political expediency blow them. So, for example, if waterboarding is acceptable today, it may not be acceptable tomorrow, at least until the next presidential election cycle, and then it's acceptable again. It just depends what the current conditions are and what the rhetoric on the mainstream corporate horror media is. Yeah, and that's uh, that's another element of um, um, another major element of the first realm uh, and of the, these cultural norms uh, is that they're reinforced not only through government-controlled media, uh, but they're also. Uh, they're also put forth uh, through entertainment. Uh, and if you look at, oh my gosh, I mean, I'm not going to get any, into any details here, but uh, you look at, uh, you know, government controlled media now uh, and, uh, you know, how, uh, how entertainment is uh, definitely, definitely, uh, I guess, uh, having it, having influence on politics. Uh, just look at, uh, uh, you know, the most recent uh, selection cycle. But uh, man, oh man, you want to talk about uh, really influencing, uh, influencing culture? Uh, that's entertainment. That's entertainment. Uh, and, and also, you know, government controlled media too. So that's certainly a, a, a major element, uh, of, uh, of the first realm. So as far as, um, for this, uh, for this last quote for this section, uh, and, uh, I guess for, for, for the, actually I'll read this real quick and, uh, then, uh, then, then continue on here. So, uh, back to the book quote, however, breaking away from mainstream culture and its various subcultures leaves the dissenter as a tolerated eccentric at best or an un unwanted troublemaker at worst. But it also puts the individual in the position of having no social integration, which is required by most of us simply for mental survival, and quote. And I would add that's uh, also for, for kind of physical survival in, in, in some sense, too. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I would say one of the, the major first steps, uh, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're really serious about solutions, if you're really serious about personal freedom, and you're really, uh, really serious about uh, seeing a, like, a free society actually exist in the form of a second realm or a mini culture, uh, the first thing that you, that you really have to do uh, is break away from uh, that culture. 
uh, you know, seriously break away from that culture, the uh, the government controlled media that's uh, oh the the propaganda. It's endless. It's endless. It can it'll it'll, it'll wear you down. Uh, it really will. Uh, but uh, then that leaves another difficulty, doesn't it, Kyle? I mean, uh, I, I know for for a fact, uh, even before uh, kind of the, the more radical stuff now, uh, back when I was a conspiracist, um, well, I guess that's yeah, kind of the kooky stuff. Uh, yeah, I definitely noticed, uh, you know, some of my family, member, family members, uh, you know, not uh, being as close to me as they used to be. Mm. Um, I, I definitely saw that. Uh, so yeah, especially when you kind of take the when you when you kind of uh, take the position of uh, anarchism. Uh, yeah, there's certainly uh, <laughs> you're definitely viewed as a uh, as a dissenter in the relationship with with uh, with people, uh, you know, in your family or friends in the first realm. Uh, yeah, those relationships, uh, you know, they're very uh, they're very likely to change. Uh, and uh, may not be pleasant, but uh, but for me, you know, I I want to I want to see Avani mini culture. I want to see a second realm. Uh, so you know that's uh, that that's that's worth it for me. But yeah, you know, it's there's there's sacrifices that have to be made. Well, uh, uh, you know, well, mm-hmm. ostracism is always on the table, and it's very interesting that the first realm, and this is fascinating because I actually I've I've talked to various people both at work and and at more other social situations, but locally right here in town in, in Austin. And it's fascinating that any time ostracism comes up, if I bring it up or somebody else brings it up and then I hop on and say, well, good for you, kid, you know, because that's actually happened like once or twice where, where somebody actually maybe not did the whole so-called defooing thing, but like ostracized somebody. Um, and I kind of and give, considering the circumstances at play, which I won't get into here because that's a pri- that's a case study that's of a private nature. Um, you know, the other folks will like look at me like I just spoke Swahili or something, and then I basically have to give a short spiel about well, you know, freedom of association also implies the right of disassociation, which of course is more commonly known as ostracizing and so forth. And I guess maybe there's different flavors of it, but generally speaking, you you just don't talk to somebody anymore. You give them the cold shoulder a little bit, and uh, technically there's no force or violence violence involved in it. In fact, ostracism can be a good thing in the sense that it can avoid a lot of potential uh, force and violence and so forth. And can just kind of side sidetrack, we're not sidetrack, but sidestep around that kind of thing, uh, which which if there really is no other option, it's like it's like the last peaceable option available in in at least some sense, especially when dialogue breaks down, when there are no lines of communication for whatever reason. And sometimes there are good reasons to not have lines of communication, by the way, in some circumstances, um, then then ostracism is, is always there, because, of course, if that's not respected, then you get situations like prison. Those people, those people don't want to associate with each other. Prisoners don't want to be there. They don't want to associate with the guards and in, in, in the power relationships that they do. Look at the prison. Uh, look at the Stanford prison experiment. So whenever the uh, freedom of association is violated, you have all these sort of perverse uh, situations. Also, ask anybody in a public school too, right? And it's like nobody wants to be there. And granted, it's not. It's arguably not as intense as being in prison, which is a 24/7 thing. But still, it's a huge chunk of one's day when you're in the when you're in those public schools. And then it's also uh, augmented by the fact that, or excuse me, it's exacerbated by the fact that the students in question are not are usually not fully formed adults, but rather are children in their formative years. Now, I guess the closest equivalent of an actual prison school situation would, of course, be a boarding school where they are there 24/7. But unless such schooling, whether it's boarding school or like a normal you go there during the day type of thing, unless it's voluntary, unless it's voluntary, you're going to get all these weird, perverse uh, types of side effects, one of which is actually bullying. And bullying itself is a form of coercive interaction, too. So it's funny that like a lot of these – as a yeah, side – You're right. I mean it's, a, it's sad that you're a product of your environment. I, I, think, is, I think that's how the phrase is. So yeah, if you're mm-hmm. raised in a um... – in a coercive culture, if you're, uh, you know, coerced to uh, go to government schools, uh, it's not a surprise uh, that uh, that that culture, uh, you know, seems to become ingrained, uh, and its uh, and its yeah. values uh, exemplified. Right, and so it's not completely crazy that you would have a high school graduate of a public school basically look at the world in general, and kind of. Maybe if they don't, and most of them I don't think would explicitly say this, but I guess implicitly they're kind of viewing nation states kind of like how they view schools. 
So yeah, you could transfer, you could move to a different area and go to a different school district. Public school is what I'm talking about here, ladies and gentlemen. You could have, or shall we say, your parents move with you in tow to a different uh, neighborhood that gets you to a different school district and a different school where you can, where you are forced to associate with maybe, shall we say, a different caliber of people based on their affluency. And thus maybe some cultural norms might be different because there's more uh, Federal Reserve notes lying around. I mean, maybe, I don't know. That That's kind of a debatable point. Uh, but suffice it to say, maybe that's not completely different analogously from when some for from, say, when when people are looking at which countries they want to expatriate to. And like, well, this other nation state on this other continent has such and such laws versus this other one with these other set of laws. And, well, I think I want to be on that one versus the other one, because it's basically like choosing school districts. And that, I think, is – I don't think I'm completely off base on that one because it's the frame of reference is completely limited. Nobody's – I mean the equivalent of setting up a second realm – would be analogously similar to either setting up a private school or even setting up like a homeschooling co-op where you're just kind of opting out. It's not just actually it's not just opting out of the public school district system or and the political situation. It's opting out of the whole nation state system, which ironically is global. So so much for your global government thing, right? That some people would claim are their greatest fears. It's already right. global in a sense. You know, intergovernmental organizations, much the IGOs, that is the global government, at least in some sense. But the, even the cooperating nation states kind of form a de facto global government because all governments are global. You know, right. OK, well, without getting into a political science lesson too much, it's already there because there are no other options for the for for the most part. So basically, to kind of go along with the analogy here. Any, so if, if in terms of setting up a second realm, it's kind of analogous to building something like either a private school, a truly full privatized public school, or, or analogous to a homeschooling uh, co-op type thing. And then at that point, it's just expanding and expanding it to where it's a wider and wider network, maybe a network of fully privatized homeschools or shall we say different portions of the second realm or a network of homeschooling co-ops that are spread around the place. And that, too, would be kind of part of the second realm, so to speak. You know, it's, it's building something completely different that's outside the grasp of, shall we say, those public school districts or those nation states uh, to follow the analogy. Right, right, and uh, uh, you were mentioning uh, institutions now, so let's uh, get back to uh, get back to the book real quick, and then we'll uh, we'll discuss further. Quote, but worse than this is being removed from cooperative functions of society. Many institutions of our society were originally created to streamline cooperation between individuals. Since then, however, they have been taken over and remodeled to support state dominion. These institutions are numerous, and we we'll, we will only list uh, the most important ones here. Uh, money and banking systems. Property titles, identity, papers, passports, etc. Licenses, regulations, and insurance. Law enforcement and security. Legal system, courts, correction and punishment. Education and media. Communication, energy and transportation networks. Charity, now welfare. Each of these institutions and services are tightly controlled by the state. Access and provision are limited for those are not, those that are not perceived as enemies of the system and those that follow cultural norms. These systems are necessary for successful cooperation between individuals to satisfy the needs they cannot satisfy alone. Uh, one second, let me just make sure. Okay, yeah, end quote. So, yeah, I mean, uh, these things, I mean, there's, uh, wh when it comes to, I guess, any portion of the human experience, uh, obviously the, uh, you know, whether it's uh, private adjudication, private policing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, the, the reason that there's calls for that is because, uh, you know, the state has taken over uh, those areas and, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, certainly, uh, you know, remodeled to support uh, state dominion. So, I mean, these are all very important things. I mean, uh, money and banking systems, uh, that's why cryptocurrencies are so big right now and why uh, uh, they're so um, so important in the, uh, in the, in, in the in economic freedom. Uh, property titles. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, being able to, to clearly delineate who owns what, uh, definitely crucial uh, for human interaction. Uh, identity, which uh, that's for, for, for second realmers, uh, you know, uh, for second realmers in their uh, second realm, possibly, sure. But uh, that one I don't see as being uh, absolutely crucial, uh, except for, you know, peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of, uh, you know, the... Uh, like the uh, papers, passports, uh, you know, the, no the social security numbers, things like that. So I'm not sure why that one is uh, put in here as an important institution. 
Uh, licenses, re regulations, and insurance. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, as I said, law enforcement, security, legal system, courts, correction, and punishment. Uh, you know, they're uh, you know in this uh, second realm book, and also, I'm trying to remember if uh, in hashtag Agora or some other one. I think they talked about it in hashtag Agora, but uh, but yeah, you know, private uh, you know legal systems uh, and second realms. That's certainly certainly a necessity, right? Uh, unfortunately, uh, there are some folks that don't respect uh, respect private property, and there has to be a way to deal with those folks. And some people do make mistakes. Uh, and there has to be a way to, to deal with those folks and you know provide restitution to the victims and all that stuff. Uh, as I as I mentioned a, a moment ago, education and media. Yeah, you know media is uh, I, w I would say you know overall you know generally speaking, uh, media uh, and education I guess media and education are um, I mean I would say more more neutral. Um, whereas uh, now uh, education and media I would say more schooling and media. Uh, they're certainly slanted in favor of the state. Uh, you won't get on any of those big networks talking about anarchism and how to abolish the state. I mean, you just won't. Um, and, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, communication, energy, and uh, transportation. We're talking, you know, public works there, uh, public services, public utilities, uh, so-called. And then, uh, yeah, charity, now welfare, uh, which they do talk about in – uh, that second, in this uh, second round book on strategy uh, later on, which we'll which we'll get to, uh, a cert oh, a way to uh, I guess uh, I guess one of them would be kind of insurance. Then also uh, there's another example he used that uh, you know say uh, I'm in a second realm and I have a family and I got uh, I get locked up for tax evasion or something like that. Uh, then uh, there would be kind of a charity program set up so that uh, you know well uh, while I'm you know incarcerated uh, my family could be supported well uh, well I'm uh, you know away. So yeah, a lot of these things are seriously important, Kyle. Uh, but uh, yeah, all of them have been, uh, you know, taken on by the state, and that's why uh, they're all in uh, <laughs> they're all in uh, shambles. Well, yeah, they've been relegated to the so-called public sector, and as such, they're they are susceptible to the tragedy of the commons. So, or at least a lot of those institutions have. So let's let's maybe take these one by one real quick. So money and banking systems. To be fair, well, actually, well, mm -mm -mm, Federal Reserve. Oh, wait, I think I just answered that. Okay, never mind. <laughs> of course, there's also the big banks, but come on, they work, They have to work hand in glove with the Federal Reserve, right? So whether whether it's one of the big banks or it's the Federal Reserve itself, I mean, central banking is the norm, unfortunately. Hence why the form of pushback has been like cryptocurrencies, right? Well, yeah, yeah, cri yeah cryptocurrencies for sure. And um, I guess before that, at least to some extent, silver and gold, although they – uh, yeah, I guess the difference between those and cryptocurrencies is you can pay for you can pay for stuff in cryptocurrencies, whereas uh, you know it's hard to do anything with uh, you know carrying around gold shavings or uh, silver coins. Um, so so yeah, I mean most most places don't accept it. I'm sure I'm sure you could deal with private individuals who'd be willing to do that, but mm -hmm. but yeah, man. I, 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 thankfully thankfully there are um, I guess as as a positive to these obstacles, um, there are I guess second realm solutions to them. Of course, of course, uh, they're, they're, but also think about the cultural aspect of it too, because even even people, well, not just people at work, but even but even the other locals here in town, they only view many of them only view Federal Reserve notes as as a form of money because it's what the IRS will accept in payment for in payment of taxes, and it really is that kind of raw gut bottom line. So there you have an influence of you you have a you know laws of the state so to speak that actually have changed cultural norms, such as people's perception of money because of the tax laws. So there, and so even when you look at something real, like what Karl Menger said in the 19th century about the origins of money, to paraphrase, the origins of money lie not in the state. It is not the product of a legislative enactment. It is something that basically came about between people who were trading based on what was commonly valuable. Then it's like, holy crud. The state has become so massive and so Leviathan-ish, if, if that's a word, Leviathan-ish, is that a word? Maybe it should be. Well, it's it be is now. Yeah. It's become so Leviathan-ish that people, that e even locals here, their only perception of money are Federal Reserve notes. And anything not Federal Reserve notes is not money. Well, actually, it's more, actually, if you want to be perfectly honest, it's actually fiat currencies because there were some people here that actually use euros, but that's more of a limited uh, area here in Austin. Huh. But yeah, that's it's basically, strange. it's basically, well, that's more of a side note, but it's more like the only form of money are fiat currencies because that's what, what's, that's what governments accept in payment of taxes. 
And it yeah, and uh, and and we we trust government uh, with money, but uh, oh, private individuals, no, you know the you know that's that's. That's not a question. You know, people people are scammers, Kyle. Mm-hmm. So and so like the next item on. Hence why cryptocurrencies, you know, to the mainstream, uh, have been called a scam so many times. Yeah, yeah there are a lot of them that because are. Because of that cult, but... because of that cultural prejudice, that I just mentioned, that that only the government can dictate money, even though historically that's not the case, as Menger pointed out. So the cultural norm is that because of the tax laws, therefore the government by default, because the people have allowed them to do so. That the government has dictated what is and what is not money. And worse, if you want to go to the federal constitution, it does say, unfortunately, that the Congress shall have the power to coin to coin and regulate money and the value thereof or something to that effect. So there's also right. that delegated power of uh, in the constitution, which kind of – which even you know, the limited government people have to kind of go, ugh. You know, they, it, the, you know, that, that is that it's enumerated coin, and, you know, coin money. Like what does coin money mean? I guess I guess with coin money, I guess some of the nicer limited government people would say something like, "Well, silver coins." Well, yeah, but now they're 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 making other assumptions. It's like, well, it wasn't exclusively a monopoly thing granted to Congress because if you read the the Federalist slash Anti Federalist papers, it was just that they could, yeah, well, could this, could that. The reality of it in both economic terms and cultural terms is that all this time later. The only thing people view as money is the government issued fiat currency vis-a-vis through the Federal Reserve. That's the bottom line. Now, the next line item here was about property titles. Obviously, for those folks who haven't listened to it, uh, there was, I think, the episode you and I did on uh, fee simple versus a lodial title and all that. Yep. The state is your landlord. Basically, yep. the long and short of that is that basically they assume to have basically the government owns all the land. And anybody who is considered a uh, private landholder is really just it's it's a nicer form of rent, more or less. Uh, this is why things like eminent domain, among other powers of the state, are viewed kind of like a trump card of sorts against private landowners. So really, the, the government owns all the land. That's just kind of bottom line. So whether the land is technically designated as private or technically designated as public, i.e. directly government owned versus, I guess, Indirectly government owned, I may maybe. Uh, then yeah, it, it all the distinction almost doesn't matter. Except of course, if you're you're if you're at a find yourself in a bit of lawfare, then the technical distinctions, the legal distinctions, might actually matter. If for example, you're in a court case. But if we're talking about first principles and we're talking about reality as it is, the government views itself as owning all the land. That's the bottom line. Yep. It's uh, uh, it's it's the king's fiefdom. Yeah, basically. Um, so with identity, papers, passports, etc. Uh, again, the government assumes a monopoly to basically dictate one's identity, and in so, and it's it's funny, you know, leftists more so than anybody else, in a lot of ways are really concerned about. Well, there's actually the entire term called identity politics, and what's fascinating, and and other and other authoritarians have picked up on this too because they're not completely stupid, but the whole notion of identity politics is really funny. So people will get all all up and tizzy about, oh, well, this term is insulting or that term is offensive, and you need to refer to me by this language instead of that language. Otherwise, you're a bigot kind of thing. And this is all hilarious because the shared assumption by all of them is that everybody must have a birth certificate. Everybody must have a social security card number thing. Everybody, I was wondering where you're going with that. <laughs> mm-hmm. they're, they're dodging the the really core issue of identity. They're focusing on all these superficialities, whether it's based on skin color or genitalia or some other or, – or even uh, the types of people one may be wanting to copulate with, OK, to put it in a PG-13 way. Um, all that stuff is incredibly superficial. What actually matters are what the laws about one's identity is. So yes, it does relate to the so-called legal person, but the more important part are the components of said legal persons as evidenced by things like birth certificates, um, you, drivers, driver licensure if you have a driver's license, and uh, let's say any professional uh, certifications you may have, uh, college degrees actually is part of it too uh, to some, in some sense. I mean all of that kind of stuff. I mean, hell, I, I, even in the book, they mention passports specifically. You know, it's it's that monopoly on dictating individual identity, which is which is particularly reprehensible. And neither the authoritarian left nor the totalitarian right ever bring it up, which is another reason neither of them will bring up paper tripping 
as a as a form of pushback against the uh, uh, corp against the uh, well both corporate and uh, government bureaucracies. They'll never mention paper tripping ever, not once, because it's the point of commonality. Right. Yeah. That the, yeah, that, that's, the, that, uh, that the government true. that the government has a monopoly on dictating legal documents. And God help anybody. God help anybody who actually tries to issue their own private documents. And as much as I don't like the sovereign citizens, I will give credit where credit is due on one thing re relevant here. They experimented with privately issued legal documents, which obviously got them in hot water. But it was an interesting experiment, whether it was privately issued license plates, you know, whether it was privately issued this that you would usually think are government monopolies. They actually tried this. Different versions of the sovereign citizens did this, and they got in a whole heap of trouble. Multiple ones did. And so it showed that even if you tried, you know, with, we, even without the baggage of the sovereign citizen ideology, even if you tried issuing your own private, um, let's say, uh, identity documents, the state and it's – well, more specifically, the agents of the state will make an assumption – that they are fraudulent and at the very least prosecuted for it, maybe not to get a conviction, assuming you didn't do anything technically illegal, but at the very least they'll prosecute you for it if, if you give them half a chance. And that's exactly what happened with many folks. So that itself is the a, only uh, the, the only exception there with, uh, you know, people with, you know, people being able to generate passports and sell them without uh, being tossed in a cage if it's something and this is a, a really side tangent but uh, if it's something like a model nation where you, you were like I, I declare my house or i declare uh, the house that i live in as um you know in Kapistan, and uh then you know i sell passports and obviously they're not going to be accepted anywhere um but the state's not going to do anything because then they'll be legitimizing it um other than just kind of a uh, i guess kind of a, a gag i guess you could say just kind of a, a souvenir um so that'd be the only there, there have been many people that have done model nations in the past uh sea land it has issued hundreds of thousands of passports um and uh you know they've never they've never gotten in trouble so um none of the ones that i know have ever gotten in trouble but yeah if you're if you're directly challenging the state uh, you know, like by, you know, private documents, um, trying to confront them. Uh, yeah, they're not going to like that too much. I mean, yeah, it's a monopoly, right? They're, they're the ones that deal with all that stuff. You can't because you're just a peasant. Right, basically. And moving on to the next item, licenses, regulations. Well, obviously, well, the licensure I just kind of touched on, the regulations are interesting because, again, Hmm. There is that older LUA episode on the administrative agencies and all that, which basically mm -hmm. uh, went into exhaustive detail on regulations themselves. Short version here is basically uh, the government bureaucracy gave itself extra constitutionally at the very least, if not outright unconstitutionally, either version, uh, gave, unilaterally gave themselves the ability – or shall we say technically Congress did, but uh, gave birth the bureaucracy to basically make their own laws, but they don't call them laws. They call them regulations, and hence this is what political scientists refer to as quote-unquote rulemaking, which is what bureaucrats do. And these, these, this rulemaking power, which is essentially a legislative power, is not done by a legislature. It's done by bureaucrats, and ultimately the, this rulemaking power results in something called regulations. So when the FDA or the FCC issue regulations, that is an exercise of that particular administrative agency's rulemaking power to basically make up their own laws. And these, of course, are published – if it's federal government, it's published in the Federal Register. So it's like a government within a government already. So now the, con the, the, the controlled schizophrenia just keeps getting piled on and piled on and piled on. I guess maybe the closest equivalent to a government regulation might be a corporate policy, but I don't know. Corporate policies – are yeah, they don't, nicer. they don't get they don't get enforced by the by the barrel of a gun. Uh, and if you don't want to follow those rules, well, you get fired. Uh, you don't you don't visit the establishment, or you you know you you, you just quit or you get fired. Yeah, it's it's some form of ostracism, right? If you work for them, if you work for like a corp, uh, some sort of multinational corporation or whatever, uh, you can either quit. you have to, you have to, you, you you have to be in line with their company culture. Yeah. Uh, so there's uh, so yeah there's there's that too. Yes, but at least but at least the enforcement of it is for the is for the most part pretty peaceful, even if it's distasteful. Uh, you either get fired or you can take the the initiative and quit. Um, if you're a customer, uh, you just simply 
simply don't buy anything from them, right? And uh, you can even use free speech and basically say such and such corporation has bad business uh, uh, habits or whatever because of XYZ policies and all that, right? Uh, that's what protesters used to do back in the day, back when they had at least a tiny bit of integrity and such. Of course, I've noticed they don't really do that anymore, which I find interesting. Um, insurance. Now, that's interesting because – correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the insurance industry, regardless of the form of insurance – the insurance industry is basically fascist, right? They are very tight at least, with the government. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say so. Um, at least, uh, well, I mean, every major industry is definitely fascistic in nature uh, and also socialistic in nature too, right? Um, but I think the, the the glaring one here is uh, car insurance, considering yeah. that's uh, uh, that's mandatory in a lot of states. So um, they've definitely, you know, the uh, you want to talk about a, a fascistic relationship? Oh man, you know State Farm for car insurance—they've made a killing off of that because they can charge more because you have to have it. Um, you know, and, and because the government laws, the, right? Know. Because the government laws man mandating a hypothetically privately issued uh, form of insurance, but it's not really privately issued; it's fascistically issued. Right, and 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 see, I guess uh, as a comparison here, um, like you can get, uh, like like I pay around pay around forty forty fifty bucks for liability only insurance, which is not bad at all. I mean, it's it's cheap as hell compared to what I paid a few years back. Um, but like in New Hampshire, you can get uh, like full policies. I heard uh, one of the uh, one of the folks there, I'm not going to say any names, not a big fan of him. I know you aren't either, uh, but he was saying that uh, you know he has full coverage for like twenty or twenty five bucks a month because it's not uh, it's not mandatory. So they they have to uh, compete. They actually have to compete for business. Um, they have to, you know, make it make it worthwhile for people to pay for the service. Whereas, uh, yeah, with with insurance here in the first realm, oh boy, yeah, definitely uh, fascistic, and it's uh, it's also coercive too. I mean, let's say uh, I think in in uh, Illinois that is a uh, may, maybe a misdemeanor. I don't know. Uh, not not something you would mess with. I mean, jail time is on the table. Uh, so. So, yeah. Yeah, and one of the articles in my Right to Travel series was strictly focused on uh, mandatory insurance as it, as it is here in Texas and, and all that. Um, but just for purpose of time, let me get through these next couple quickly. So they also mention in the book law enforcement and security and then, of course, legal systems, courts, correction, and punishment. <laughs> Again, that's all lawfare. Uh, the use of law as a weapon against the citizenry as a, as a weapon of war, more or less. So law enforcement, that would be your government police, uh, the bludgies, the king's guards, um, the blue coats. Uh, extortionists. Mm -hmm. Road pirates, I think, was another phrase I've heard used. There, there's, there's all sorts of incredibly insulting terms, which, of course, are also incredibly accurate uh, to regarding the uh, so-called law enforcement officers or Leos or what have you. But, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like for the umpteenth time, please read Dr. Roger Roots' Our Cops Constitutional to really get an idea about the constitutionality of, like, so-called professional law enforcement of, and, and all that. Yeah, and, and, and one, one other thing there with law enforcement security, uh, you know, uh, sorry, you know, conservatives and neocons and, I guess, just uh, uh, cop suckers in general, uh, you know, the, uh, the culture of, uh, I guess, uh, Blue of lives justice. Matter. Blue lives matter, uh, right? Yeah, yeah yep. Uh, well, the culture of law so-called law enforcement in the United States, you know, as you mentioned, Roger Roots is our cops constitutional. Uh, the culture of, of justice was a lot different than what it is today. So, mm -hmm. sorry, conservatives. Uh, you know, one of those, uh, ori one of those, uh, you know, original founding values and principles. Uh, you know, you're uh, you're actually you, the ones you complain about so much, how things are changing. We need to get back to the roots of America. Uh, well, uh, you know, maybe we should start there. Well, it's also funny. Well, it's not just that either, because I remember when Black Lives Matter started. And although there were some other factors involved, which ain't too great, eventually at some point their uh, protest demands at least focused at least at some point on reforming the police and making them so uh, softer, kinder, and cuddlier. Hell, even at one point they wanted to abolish civil asset forfeiture, which is one of the very few things I actually agree with Black Lives Matter about wholeheartedly because yeah. of civil two, asset forfeiture. Two, two out of ten of things on their platform. We mm -hmm. did an, uh, an LUA episode on it. Right. Um, the, uh, yeah, it was uh, the Black Lives Matter manifesto. Uh, but yeah, like two out of ten of them. Fantastic. But yeah. the other eight, obviously, it's all political crusading and, uh, uh, yeah. Right, right. And civil asset forfeiture is itself a use a, a use of lawfare, which, of course, is a form of coercion and very much part of the first realm because it's an outright denial of, of property rights, even legally. Uh, even legally. Uh, but what was fascinating was that when it came down to BLM actually getting close to accomplishing their objectives or at least advocating for their objectives, even though they didn't get anywhere close to achieving them, it was basically, well, it wasn't abolish the police. 
I think maybe only one or two individuals of BLM ever said that. The mainline, shall we say, manifesto, the mainline rhetoric was, we want police accountability. I'm like, what does that mean? Does that mean you videotape everybody all the time? Because Lord knows coplock.org and various other people in uh, the the, the uh, New Hampshire area, for whatever reason, made – there are all sorts of people focused on that. And how much police accountability has truly arisen from that? You know, like how many, how many cops have – like I've asked before – on previous episodes and other articles I've written, how many how many cops have lost their jobs and been fired? Never mind getting imprisoned, but just gotten fired because they murdered somebody, or because they beat somebody senseless who actually because it was the, they were resisting an unlawful, an openly admitted unlawful arrest. So there well, is it, no it accountability. Happen, it happens it happens so little that it's uh, literally a miracle uh, when it does. Yeah, but then, but then it's like, well, why bother videotaping the police? Don't get me wrong. I think people should have the freedom to do so without having their free speech and, and liberty of the press being uh, censored. Obviously, that's wrong, but that's not my question. My question was in a more utilitarian aspect, what are the proven results of reigning in the police and making them accountable by videotaping them or even, or even other means uh, that are similar to that, like protesting every other time somebody gets murdered by a bludgy? And last time I checked, aside from some very specific case studies were actually completely unrelated to videotaping, et cetera, uh, the cop did get uh, at least prosecuted, at least to some degree, not always convicted, of course, because a lot of times they get they got the juries actually acquit these guys. Remember, I think there was uh, I think there was one that happened even somewhat recently where it was kind of repeating that same thing. The jury keeps acquitting all these cops because I, I guess during void air, I guess. Both lawyers want to make sure that the juries are biased in favor of the police, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's I mean, there's that, too. So, I mean, so, so I guess there's your real world jury tampering, uh, but it's yeah, the legalized. Yeah, your uh, your first realm uh, uh, injustice system. Yeah, exactly. But again, regardless of these, you know, specific, regardless of these kind of details or even more specific details or even more generalized details. The bottom line, though, is that the legal system is mono- is a monopoly. And that's kind of a problem because it's not privatized at all. And it's funny that some people will complain about the privatized prisons, and it's like, have you look at the non-privatized typical government dungeons? I don't know, man. I mean, prison is prison is prison. And the so-called private prisons ain't even private. They're corporate. They're corporate right. prisons. So, I mean, this confusion that the left does constantly, even that even that guy at work I mentioned a little bit ago, where – uh, basically, cap- they, they make this assumption that capitalism is fascism and fascism is capitalism, that they're just synonyms for each other. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Can't you just have private property without you know, lobbying and otherwise bribing legislators to pass laws favorable to your particular industry? And- right, right. And, and, and one thing I do want to mention here. Uh, is that for for legal system courts uh, correction and or actually yeah for yeah for for those things legal system uh, courts correction and punishment um, there's a very specific portion of this book that covers that and one of the things that I found intriguing and uh, one thing I, I I kind of liked about it I mean I've done a lot of uh, archiving court documents that are available you know for the public um, that's kind of the uh, the first realm system but uh, uh, I guess just a, a brief, uh, a brief, a brief uh, summary here of, of what they what what they would do and or what uh, suggestion was for the second realm is that uh, only the details, uh, the, the the details of the case uh, and the and the result thereof is only is only known to the, uh, the I guess the using I guess the first realm uh, first realm terms the defendant the plaintiff and uh, the adjudicator only those three people know. Uh, what happened in the case, and uh, you know, beyond that, everything else is uh, private because anonymity and security and privacy uh, are absolutely crucial to the second realm. So that's just an interesting difference between the first and the second realm, uh, or at least a, a potential possibility for the uh, second realm uh, justice system. Yeah, but even but even what what the book what the book on strategy even referred to is that it's also kind of like nobody else's business either. Because exactly well, because like what the first realm lawyers would call like starry like various different so-called legal principles, but one of which relevant here would be like starry decisis. Starry something like starry decisis is already irrelevant in the second realm because each of these, uh, shall we say, contract disputes, which is what they really are, each of these contract disputes are on a case by case basis anyway. 
So even the entire notion of case law is a moot point. Therefore, there really isn't really a need for transparency. And in fact, transparency is actually kind of, uh, kind of, kind of a, uh, if not necessarily a bad thing, at least at the very least, it's frowned on. As opposed to the first realm, where you really do need transparency, because otherwise, the the state with its monopoly on coercion can basically set up its own uh, secret police force and basically black bag anybody they want. Actually, they can do that now. They just have to they they just have to worry more about the PR stuff, uh, which is why they try to have a semblance of uh, public trials like the Constitution mentions um, and, and other legal uh, statutes and, and whatever mention about having public trials and so forth because of due process. But the only reason for things like due process and, and that kind of stuff with is because those were – and even jury trials uh, and jury nullification as an extension of jury trials. The only reason for any of that stuff is that those were stopgap methods while the monopoly government is still around and has always been for thousands of years. Right, Juries were originally started because of – it was actually under a monarchist form of government. It was under monarchy that jury started. It wasn't with these democratic republics that are so in vogue now. Or even oligarch, or even oligopolies and oligarchies. It was under monarchy that jury started, not because monarchy is a good form of government, but because there was some there was some sort of legal protection that was demanded and finally enforced uh, by the people. And yes, sometimes special interests, but through a combination of both, there were some legal protections that kind of got in, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it doesn't. At least throughout history, I would say recent history kind of t- gives a gives a different answer, I think. But but that was how it originally started. And the entire notion of due process was, again, a stopgap mitigation type thing to prevent the very worst of abuses under the frame of reference of these nation states and all that. So but this wasn't anything to really aspire to. This isn't anything to build a brand new culture on, which is what the second realm is all about. So yes, I'm glad you pointed out the difference between a privatized adjudication and the government monopoly court system. But yeah, the values are very different, obviously. And speaking of that, the next one was education and media. Well, that's very interesting because let's see, um, they're pretty much all fascist. Well, actually, hold on. The so-called mainline public school system is socialist because it has a uh, well. At least a portion of, I guess, a portion of it does. But then, for some odd reason, they've been they've been growingly tolerant of, I guess, some private schools which are arguably fascist if they accept government funding. But then, some at the well, same yeah, time, and, and you they, also have they, they have to follow us. They have to follow a strict. Uh, they still have to follow a strict. Uh, uh, to, to get accredi- uh, accreditation, they do have to follow kind of a, a strict state mandated uh, or state approved uh, curriculum and such. So yeah, it's definitely still. It might be just a touch better, but not uh, not not much. Right, and then at the same time, you have the development of like homeschooling, whether it's homeschooling families or homeschooling co-ops or homeschooling fill in the blank uh, version and theme thereof, which the state really hates and has really been trying to crack down on. Uh, in 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 various times and places, and so some places of America have less homeschooling regulations, and other places have more onerous homeschooling regulations, and so forth. And thankfully, there's actually a couple that, frankly, don't have any. Um, but yeah, it's yeah, been Illinois is very lenient, which is surprising. Right. So it's it's very much kind of this 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 tug back and forth between, um, much like Murray Rothbard pointed out in uh, Education Free and Compulsory. Uh, that um, the state has basically been at war with parents over control of their children was how was more or less how he phrased. It. Now, when you look at the media, which is arguably similar, that is more fascist, right? Big media. Uh, I think it used to be like the big five. Now it's like the big three or however many there are, you know, uh, these these multinational corporate entities that basically parrot at the state line because, of course, um, when you look in things like the comprehen- and the various different comprehensive annual financial reports by different governments, uh, they actually own stock in a lot of these uh, multinationals, uh, media conglomerates and all that, which is actually really kind of troubling when you consider what is supposed to be the exercise of the liberty under the press vis-a-vis the, the federal constitution's First Amendment and all that, not to mention the various state constitutions equivalent of li- liberty of the press like what we have here in Texas and, and you know other places. So basically, if the government actually has stock in these uh, – you know, can you imagine those shareholder meetings? 
<laughs> that, oh, we have a representative from the blah, 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 because of X number of shares we've got in, uh, let's say, CBS or Fox or pick somebody. And uh, Sen- therefore, Senator, Ro- Senator Robs- Robinson, you have five minutes. Mm hmm. Or whatever government agent and, is. And uh, and honestly, I would love to be a fly on the wall during those shareholder meetings when several of their shareholder representatives are directly government agents. I would love that. That would be a wonderful expose too at some point in the future. If uh, you know, if if you know, if somebody wanted to like leak me something or whatever, because I would so love that because that would be the closest thing to direct proven control of the government, not just not just peripherally, not just the corporate uh, reporters basically just parroting whatever was said at a, at a government press conference, but direct incentivized control of what is supposed to be the free press. And yes, I am talking mainstream media, but like proving it directly, that would be wonderful because in other times and places, the state's um, control of media is is more is more total and complete, but it's also more obvious. But you see, the situation here in America is that they had to be a lot more subtle about it. Hence, the use of corporations, which, of course, themselves are creatures of the state to basically run these multimedia, these so-called multimedia empires. And even if you look at even what are supposed to be like the neutral, uh, the so-called neutral news wires like Associated Press or Reuters, uh, they too have uh, shareholders who, shall we say, are of the public of the so-called public sector. So, you know, the these assumptions that some of these socialists and other lefties make about, oh, you know, oh, it's the corporations is the corporations do that. And the reason we don't we the socialists don't like corporate media is because, well, they're corporate. It's kind of like really kind of missing the point here because then, of course, their whole big solution to everything under the planet is that they want to use big government as a bulwark against big business, which, of course, doesn't make any sense because they're it's almost like they're kind of assuming there's kind of it's like a chicken and the egg problem, except it isn't. There's actually a direct uh, call. <laughs> there's actually a direct uh, line of causation here. First came the government, then came the corporations. So claiming that, well, we just need to control the corporations. And and we do that by going to the government and getting laws passed and all that kind of stuff. And we need more regulations like that coworker of mine put it. It's like, but wait a minute. The corporations only exist because of the government. You really have like cause and effect really kind of not even turned around. It just kind of helter skelter all over the place according to your preferences because, well, you have issues. And that's yeah, something that's, else. Uh, that's that's a symptom of uh, control. Uh, the trivium, tri- the trivium, like of not 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 uh, using the trivium method to cause and effect is certainly, uh, you know, certainly something at play there. Um, but uh, but communication. Uh, what do you think about the the, the public uh, the public works here? Well, yeah. So when you look at whether it's telecommunications, the energy grid, and roads, that that's your transportation network. Well, that's interesting. So there's been recent moves now to try and either nationalize or otherwise render the technically you would it would be fair to call it the corporate telecommunications networks by the very these various multinationals uh in some ways kind of what we're using right now sort of um to basically try and turn it into like a direct government owned thing because now it's like some people are now saying stuff like oh we need to lobby uh the government to make the internet like a public utility it's like are you crazy they already did that with the electrical grid and look how that turned out. Um, and and so that's – and then it's funny too because speaking of the electrical grid, there was that other th- that other article I wrote where a portion of which dealt with because the electric grid is a public utility, it's actually – the government uh, – offic- the federal government officials specifically were actually worried that because it's a, the energy grid is a public utility, therefore it's more susceptible to terrorist attacks or not even necessarily that but even just some sort of catastrophic socioeconomic you know, collapse, meltdown, you know – otherwise grid down scenario so it's kind of like okay so yeah, everyone would be fucked i mean you you hear you hear a lot of stories about people in winter like the uh, public utilities are shut off because they didn't pay for like three months and uh they end up dying you know they don't do that anymore but uh but yeah people people dying in just a few days you know because the electricity is out because they have no uh uh, no means of, uh, of of self-sufficiency. They have no inclination. They they they, they never they don't help themselves. So uh, they didn't get the help, and uh, you know they perish because of it. But yeah. Yeah, 
And and well, I mean, yeah, there's all those issues about you know dependency on certain forms of technology too. But I guess I guess that's part of it, right? Because again, if you have people who were uh, reared in the public schools and all that, and they view the teachers as authority, then of course, why not view the government and its agents thereof as a form of authority who are supposed to bestow on you these things you need for your survival, like electricity. And so and what's uh, and and what's the uh, uh, and what's the cultural norm? Uh, is it uh, independence or dependence? Yeah. yeah, and 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 how and that's the other thing. How many people are living off grid right now, as opposed to living on the grid? Not enough. Exactly. And so, and and just for purposes of time, look at the issue with the roads. Without government, who would build the roads? Is already uh, was already a disingenuous question, even if the person asking it dis- didn't necessarily mean it that way, because it's making an assumption that well, privatizing it can't possibly be an option. And if not necessarily privatizing it, that any other options other than what Dr. Walter Block in his book on the privatization of roads and highways put it, the ro- road socialism was actually how he phrased it. Because the road socialists want to, well, socialize the roads, which technically is what they are. You know, the public highways is actually legally what they're referred to as. And of course, there's all sorts of legalisms related to that that I won't get into here, which I've already done during that Right to Travel series. But suffice it to say for here, yeah, basically uh, communalizing the the roads under the auspices of the government or the so-called public with the government as a despotic – as an admittedly despotic trustee, whichever version you want to believe in – is very much a tragedy of the common situation. And then people complain about potholes or, or whatever else. And it's just kind of like, well, there is such a thing as a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to put it. I mean, it's like the energy grid thing uh, that I mentioned a moment ago. It's kind of like you take these these things that exist, you put them under the auspices of a government, you turn it into so-called public property or, pro- or even public lands, uh, or whatever version it is, and then it turns into a tragedy of the commons, and then people are whining and screaming and all that because apparently they don't understand economics, or more importantly, maybe some of them don't even want to because I guess reality is scary and they don't want to take responsibility for their own uh, for their own actions and or their own, shall we say, beliefs and the impracticality of said beliefs like public lands or some other uh, fantasies. I don't know. I mean, that's getting a little bit into psychology, but considering that this episode's about the philosophy of the first realm, I think it's real relevant that, you know, there's, I mean, look at that controlled schizophrenia too. I mean, it's, right. it's really, it's really kind of, and then it's really kind of ubiquitous. And then obviously the last item on there is, you know, the charity now welfare. And it's, it's just, yeah, charity used to be, and in some instances still is privatized. And yes, Often it was through religious organizations, churches, and so forth, Great. which of course the which of course the left hates, which I find interesting for other reasons. But you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, the whole notion of like religious freedom, at least in this country, was always kind of well. Here's the way I'll put it: if a bunch of people decide to voluntarily gather together in the woods and dance around a tree stump, which, show me the coercion because I can't find it. Now, some people can make issues about, well, the children of those people have been inculcated with the faith that they didn't choose or whatever. That's getting into that's getting into finer issues. I'm just saying, strictly speaking, between consenting adults, if a bunch of people dance around a tree stump in the middle of the woods, do they really hurt anybody? Are they violating property rights? Now, yes, to outsiders, yes, they would possi- quite possibly – some people may actually agree that, hey, maybe dancing around a tree stump is a fun activity. Maybe it will actually help the grass grow if you're a little superstitious. And then other people would be like, well, they're kind of being really superstitious weirdos. I don't want to be around the people dancing around folks uh, dancing around a tree stump for no reason. But it's like, okay, but then do the people who are dancing around the tree stump have the freedom to do something which is potentially foolish? And if the answer is no, then there is no such thing as religious freedom, and therefore that kind of paves the way for theocracy or even or even what some people would call statheism. Right, the atheists who believe in statism and all that. You know, they've just switched mm-hmm. out they've just switched out one one type of superstition for another. So they don't believe in the the what they themselves would view as the superstition of the like the man in the sky or versions thereof. But for whatever strange reason, they believe in the superstition, the most dangerous superstition, as Larkin Rose would put it, the most dangerous superstition of the belief in authority itself, which is what government bases its legitimacy off of. I am authority. I am the ruler. Like Taz saying, well, I am the state. So said Louis the Fourteenth, I believe it was. And so right. that's that that that's kind of food for thought in a lot of ways. So you look at that charity 
the charity that's that's privatized. And oh no, we can't have private charity because religion, therefore, so argue the left. So therefore, we have to have this massive welfare state that basically rules people from cradle to grave and dictates every jot and tittle they do. Right. It, so, so yeah, generally speaking, uh, uh, charity, so-called charity in the first realm, uh, you know, uh, thanks to the state, is the redistribution of wealth and violations of personal autonomy. And uh, there are also a lot of uh, negative ramifications come from that, which uh, then breed, uh, you know, future first realmers. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, I guess for, for a lot of folks uh, getting stuck in the system, you know, if they don't have to work, then, uh, you know, why would they uh, you know, do anything productive? Why would they? Uh, uh, and you'd think. And you'd think, I guess this might be an argument, well, I don't know, you'd think that if they have all this free time, they could, you know, actually pursue intellectual, they could, they could actually pursue intellectual pursuits, but, uh, yeah, that's not really what's happening, is it? So, nope. uh, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's all negative, it's all negative, and uh, the welfare issue really does breed uh, a, a lot of the uh, slave-on-slave uh, violence or slave-on-slave uh, uh I guess disagreements uh, within the within the servile society within the first realm. So, anything else there? Can we move forward? Yeah, just just keep in mind that for the listeners that this is a very brief overview. These different bu- bullet pointed items that were in the uh, second realm book on strategy that we just kind of went through in more detail. There's even more to the first realm than even that, but this is kind of more of a brief overview. Yeah, yeah. So we don't have much uh, much left to cover here. Um, but uh, certainly some some really really some really really important things. So, uh, quote: It is by regulation, licensing, and cultural dominance that access to and the provision of these institutions and services is regulated, always with a tight integration of surveillance and punishment. Though there are always cracks in this control that allow people to slip through, the main occupation for legislators and bureaucrats appears to search for and close those cracks to create a system in which these institutions, combined with a matching culture, provide a totalitarian tool set and mold each individual under the dominance of the state system. Uh, end quote. So I guess we can we can stop there. So what, uh, so, you know, as Rayo talked about, legal interstices or uh, uh, utilizing uh, gray areas in the law to increase your uh, invulnerability to coercion or to increase your personal freedom. Well, uh, maybe, I guess, si- similar to that, but, but what they're talking about here is not only, uh, you know, using law to your advantage, uh, you know, to increase your own personal freedom, but they're talking about uh, like cracks in the matrix, I guess, like cracks in the control system, uh, you know, where people can, uh, you know, opt out and, you know, start living off grid uh, or uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, they, 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 they really are correct that the, the, the goal here, and this is why, uh, you know, when, and going back to the Scott Horton, uh, the interview I did with Scott Horton last night with Somalia, uh, one of the reasons that uh, that uh, the United States uh, government intervened, uh, you know, as as I remember uh, Scott explaining it, was because they didn't have a government. And you know, well, every every country should have, like every country should have a government. I mean, they, they need those services. You know, like this is we're gonna give them a government. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna give them it because they need it. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. so it, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely, you know, the, this total, totalitarian, uh, mindset that, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, the, that, that force and coercion are the way to, uh, to, to operate things. And without that, uh, you know, they, they always have to try to get people back into the system, just like with, uh, what we talked about, maybe this is Vani, but, uh, you know, unbanking the, uh, whatever, whatever I think administrative agency it is that does their year, yearly report on, on, on banking, mm-hmm. the idea is to get people back into modern banking. It's like, well, what can we do? What regulations can we put forth? Uh, what, what can we do to help bring people into this great financial system? Yeah, and speaking about the cracks in the control, for a more, for a somewhat more specific example, you know, there's also the agorist, not exclusively agorist notion of like the gray market. So basically, things that are unregulated, and unlicensed, but not, but not outlawed, because all the outlawed stuff is, of course, black market. So even the even the very notion of like a gray market is itself kind of a crack in the matrix thing, where the lawyers didn't devise a set of laws to like stranglehold some element of the human experience. So to make this a little bit more concrete, look at something like cryptocurrencies, at least up until recently, where it was this unregulated, unlicensed, and up until now, uh, untaxed uh, type of activity, type of tool that was around that people use. Maybe not in big, in huge swaths, arguably not in huge swaths right now, but enough people were using it to the point where uh, the the regulators were uh, were kind of brought in to kind of squish down on that because – 
I guess some of the more mainstream Bitcoiners made an assumption that in order to to increase the probability of greater adoption and use of of uh, cryptocurrencies, therefore the regulators must be brought in to squish it before it really kind of takes off. I mean well, that that mindset, or that these people were uh, were just invested in modern banking and they saw you know a technological tool for modern modern banking. So well, what do you do? what's what's modern banking? Well, it's highly regulated. Uh, re regulated by the state. So, uh, okay, so, you know, let's get this into modern banking. It'd be a great tool for everybody. Uh, well, what do you do? Well, you go to the state and you work with them on regulate on, on common sense regulations. <sighs> yes, and we're forming relationships between the lobbyists and and the bureaucrats, right? And And we're supposed to be okay with this because that's part of political crusading too. Uh, and so, yeah, and anybody who's not okay with this is a bad person because they're not agreeing with the political crusaders that we basically have to help the bludgy squish our own collective neck, so to speak. I mean, that's how bad this is. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely true, definitely true. So uh, just a few, few few paragraphs here. I'll return to the book, and then, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll discuss that. And uh, then we will uh, begin to close out uh, for, for this episode. So, quote, uh, cultural codes, values, symbols, and systems and institutions of cooperation enable the state to become a spatial entity through its agents, proponents, and dependents. Culture forms the base for active consent, while access control of institution creates a soft force to keep the subjects in line. The benefits of compliance outweigh the risks of dissent. This applies to the state with the individual people that project its force into the spatial realm through their actions. This starts with simple social exclusion of dissenters, continues with snitching and inviting the state agents into situations where they are unwanted, and ends by using force against dissenters. The interwoven aspects of culture, institution, profits from redistribution, and the longing for stability form the foundation of the power of states and assure lasting consent, both passive and active, for this system of domination. We call the totality of this system the first realm, end quote. So, uh, you know, kind of came full circle, started out with that uh, quote as a definition, and uh, here we are uh, as it is. But uh, they, they, the, the authors de of this book definitely do place a high, uh, I guess, a, a high obstacle on the culture. Um, it's, I, and I, I think it's appropriate. I really didn't, until I started looking into Rayo and, uh, and Vanu, I didn't understand the significance of that. I really don't think I do, but culture, uh, if, if the culture was uh, anti-statist, uh, then uh, there'd be no one to, uh, you know, obey the laws and, uh, and, and and that sort of thing. So culture is, uh, you know, just as much a part of this evil and evil uh, first realm as the state is, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and sure, I mean, the, I think there's definitely has to be more leeway for folks in the first realm that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people, everyone goes, mostly everyone goes through all this propaganda, this government schooling and all of this. So um, there is, I, I think, some sympathy that, it's, uh, that, is, that is acceptable. But obviously people are individuals. They have the ability to critically think even if they don't. And, uh, you know, they, they choose not to, to take that responsibility. So culture is, yeah, it's definitely a major, major thing. Well, yeah, but and also the culture of the first realm is filled with controlled schizophrenia. And actually, let me let me kind of bring up something that you were kind of highlighting before. So and and I did as well. So there was that coworker of mine who like loves FDR and all that. Sorry, something else he said was rather interesting. He basically thought it was odd that the Koch brothers wanted to get rid of the FDIC. And I asked him what he liked about the FDIC. He was like, oh, well, that's another New Deal thing, and FDR is great and all that. Now, here's what's interesting. Two things about the FDIC. First, the, even the acronym FDIC is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Now, remember what that coworker of mine said when I said earlier this episode about what he said. He's against corporations. We need more regulations against corporations, but he loves the FDIC, which is itself a corporation because that's what the C in FDIC stands for. It is a corporation. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, guys, Coinbase. Uh, you know they have uh, their FDIC, uh, I guess, backed. Ugh, uh, that's great. even worse. That's even yes, worse. Great. Can can we have like less government approved uh, outlets for the human experience, please? Nope. Um, nope. Coinbase would literally suck the dicks of every government agent, uh, every government agent, if they even implied that they needed to. So. Yeah. Well, so does. Uh, well, yeah. You know. Well, yeah. So does the the Bitcoin Foundation. But yeah, that was because they had that behind clo behind closed door secret meeting with the Federal Reserve and the IRS and all those other people and FinCEN too. Uh, but yeah, it's. Uh, uh, which, of course, I wrote about and only one other person did on that I'm aware of. But, yeah, so FDIC is a corporation. So there's the controlled schizophrenia right there. 
is, well, oh, as the coworker said, oh, well, the corporations are evil. They need regulations. But I love the FDIC, which is itself a corporation because that's what the C and FDIC actually literally means. Second thing I want to point out, you were mentioning before about those surveys that were taken periodically every once in a while about the unbanked and so forth. Guess what administrative agency was the one that actually issued the surveys and, and put them out? FDIC. Mm-hmm. Yep. God damn, yeah. Yep. So the FDIC is the one that is, is the administrative agency unconstitutionally, just by its very existence, just like all the like the FAA and the FCC and insert pretty much any all just about any acronym here of the federal soup boys. It's another administrative agency. Uh, technically a corporation that basically is trying to suck people back into the uh, mainstream banking system, which is fascist. Uh, or if you look at the Federal Reserve, technically more socialist, but but regardless is authoritarian all around. And um, yeah, there, there's there's like nothing good about it. And of course, it's a product of the New Deal, which my coworker did correctly point out. But then he went and said it's a good thing, which of course I view as a bad thing because the New Deal might as well be the raw deal. It was just an excuse to establish the welfare state more solidly than it, than it are, had been up to that point historically, you know, in the 20s, 30s and so forth. So that's that's kind of where we're at. Um, you know, it's funny. It's like, oh, I hate the big banks, but I love the FDIC. It's like, you, you know, they need each other, right? <laughs> that, that's kind of how the fascists and the socialists in the government actually get along. This is how authoritarianism works. It makes use of of admittedly different class special interests, but then finds a way to kind of mesh them together because we all need to work together. We need to compromise and find a solution for what ails the body politic because that's how these bureaucrats talk. That's how these politicians talk. That's how these judges and cops and lawyers talk. And so when they talk about working together and being bipartisan, that's when the real crackdown happens. If anything, if anything, partisan bickering is almost a good thing because it means that they're that they're they're warring with each other about class special interests and at least for the time being leaving the rest of us normal people alone. And see the culture and, and it's and it's worse because the culture incentivizes all that. When you look at things like political parties, which aren't in the constitution, in some ways that's actually been created by the culture, actually. In some ways. And def yep, definitely. When you look at the presidential election cycles, not just this past recent one and its unusual kookiness, but you really look at any of them and you look at something like the presidential popular vote, that's not anywhere in the laws or the constitution more – or federal constitution more specifically. What is in the law is the electoral college, and that's what actually chooses the president or selects the president if you prefer. That's what the law actually says. And, th and thankfully, thankfully, uh, you know, the uh, – you know, the, uh, the, 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 the crybaby left actually did point that out which was fantastic they they admitted that uh, uh they 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 admitted that okay we had no say in this uh which means that you know uh we need to make it a popular vote now i mean that's what we need to do uh so they they, yeah, they actually came out and admitted but uh actually but it's a found cultural that, i actually found uh or uh beyond that there were a couple more sentences let me just wrap those up real quick when we get back to it quote Please keep in mind that we are we are here talking about the system of domination not the specific implementation or parties running it Thus far, attempts to change the system have at most changed the faces running the show, but have never fundamentally changed the game. Amen. Uh, although we may call the population support for this system unethical, misguided, stupid, or even evil, it, it is nevertheless a reality that must be faced clearly. Our challenge is of an, of, of an enormous magnitude. This is why previous strategies have failed to achieve much lasting change. End quote. So just kind of concluding uh, a couple of conclusionary points here that I wanted to, to toss in there before I forgot. But, uh, but Kyle, go ahead, man. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It, it, and that's the thing, though. So things when you look at things, uh, elements of the first realm, like political parties, like this whole presidential popular vote thing, or any of these other fantasies, even the mainstream media's coverage of presidential elections, all of that stuff is evocative of the culture. There's no laws that says that the mainstream media has to report on what the president did every jot and tittle during the election cycle or even as the case was this go around in this particular cycle, uh, his first year in office. There's no law that says they have to do that. They chose to do that. Those content producers, the editors, the to some degree even the reporters, but at the very least the guys that are making the decisions about content, they made all – they made these choices. I mean think about all the newsworthy events that are happening in the world. 
and then distilling that down to all the newsworthy events in the world that actually could be fit on the front page news or on the evening newscast or something to that effect. Never mind the 24-7 cable channels, okay? So – the amount of excuses is getting to, is approaching zero, but they still would do. But they would rather the big media, the oligopoly, the big three or whatever it is now, would rather report the same five stories, and these days apparently involving the same guy. Apparently, would rather report the same five stories than actually than actually report even on a uh, broad selection or uh, excuse me a somewhat broader selection of truly newsworthy items of things that are happening in the world so it's, it's, i'm saying that i think this is in part cultural or at least in large part because there is no government laws that dictate they must do this then when you look at you know the more fascist angle of it like what's revealed by the kaffirs and so forth there's there's government meddling at least to some greater or larger degree right uh for actually for a different example um, but the, in terms of um, cultural uh, influence by the state and so forth and vice versa. For instance, I think it was uh, one of those Spider-Man movies or whatever, but there was – in like one passing scene, you'll see a billboard uh, basically promoting joining the National Guard or whatever. And it like – it had nothing to do with the plot line. It had nothing to do with the characters or any of the fictional elements of this cultural – arguably piece of art or entertainment or whatever, but then you have this uh, propaganda placement, kind of like product placement. We have this propaganda placement mm -hmm. for people to go join an, arm, uh, an a, a organ of the state. So where is that coming from? Where is this militarism coming from? I mean, I guess it is coming from the state, but then I but then the culture also reinforces it through things like entertainment, right? There was also that other movie where the main plot line what was it the U.S. Marines versus a bunch of aliens, whatever the title was. But the plot yeah. line was like, oh, what was it? Some West Coast was it San Francisco or wherever it was it got invaded by aliens, and so the entire plot line is basically this disaster movie where the Marines are shooting at aliens, uh, extraterrestrials, not people hopping over the border, aliens. Just to clarify. Um, well, I mean, there's also another thing there too. I mean, uh, uh, as far as why these things may be happening, uh, you know, it's been well known that. Uh, uh, that uh, the Pentagon, some some like the federal government, I'll just say say that the federal government was, has been paying, uh, you know, the NFL, uh, the NFL a lot of money to like televise, uh, you know, before like five years ago they never televised the national anthem uh, or anything like that, but now they do because they got a lot of money from the state uh, to do that. So I'm guessing a lot of these movies. They get, uh, you know, checks of taxpayer dollars uh, to do these things. I would guess that has something to do with it, uh, at least at least in some instances. Oh, absolutely. And I'm also glad you brought that up for another reason. So there, there's a couple things going on there with, like, organizations like the NFL, but basically these major, again, corporate uh, sporting organizations or corporations, whether it's the NFL, whether it's MLB, whether it's NBA, or pick an acronym of these corporations that do receive direct state funding to like, I don't know, set up like a, the umpteenth stadium in, you know, XYZ city or whatever. Um, oh, that, yeah. that, yeah, that is, that is very much, um, I mean, it, it's so incredibly fascist, it's bordering on socialist because it's it's not quite a monopoly, but it's getting awfully close because how many of these major uh, sporting organizations have competition relative to their own particular sport? Like, like, let me put it this way. Who competes, what organization competes with the National Basketball Association? Anybody? I, yeah, I'm, they, I'm, yeah, they are they are monopolies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, then the National Football. The NFL. Who who are their competitors? Okay, yeah. Let me let me, let me correct that. There there are competitors, but there it's it's like arena league and just like bullshit. You know, talent. Like there's not a whole lot of talent there. Uh, you know, a lot of these stadiums. It's not the millions. Know, it's, it's it's not no, the they're, multi million they're losing, dollar contract. Lose, a, a lot of them are losing money. Yeah. So they're like they're, so. You're I guess talking like semi pro. Is, yeah. There is, I guess, competition, but it's not competition. It's it's the facade of competition because I think what you're kind of getting are like the semi pro or whatever the term is. We're not talking yes. like the mil million dollar player contract type major leagues, right? Oh, minor leagues. That's what I was trying. To use. Yeah, you're talking more about minor leagues. And see, there's even in the language. That's another thing that's also cultural too. Even in the language with all the sporting stuff, there's this between major leagues and the minor leagues. The minor leagues would be like your semi pros, who. Or I think you described it well. The major leagues would be the guys with the multi-million dollar contracts that, oh, by the way, get a lot whole chunk, chunk of their funding from the state. And again, who are their competitors? Um, 
you know, you look uh, actually, let's take baseball, major league baseball. Uh, who, who's, who are the, who are the professional level competitors, organizations who compete against the MLB? Anybody? Cause there I aren't. And, and that's, and that, that's a good mm-hmm. point too, because if they're like, even, even if there is like a, a, a competitor to the MLB at that kind of, at that, at a similar level, uh, it's all overseas. Like there's not, so, so yeah, you have like the Europe league and the Canadian league. Um, but the, the competition, there is no competition, uh, in the United States. There's no possible way. And, uh, I would say in large part because of the fasc- the fascistic, uh, I guess, placement or positioning, um, it, it's not financially feasible, uh, for, uh, you know, for, for anyone to try to compete with them. Um, so yep. I'd, I'd be interested I'm not going to do this myself, but I'd be curious to see, uh, you know what, like there, there was like the, uh, the predecessor to the NFL. Um, I'd be curious to to, to find out then, uh, you know, if if the state saw this as an opportunity. I mean, do, they do like to infiltrate entertainment and propagandize. That's mm-hmm. that's not a conspiracy at all. I'd be curious to see how much uh, of an influence or an impact uh, the state had in these uh, this first and and this I guess specific example of first realm entertainment uh, and how that uh, I mean how, how if if that if that, if that was kind of like the uh, if that was kind of like the uh, the agricultural uh, industry where uh, <laughs> it really didn't take off until, you know, corn syrup was subsidized and all, I guess all the right. subsidies in general. So I'd be curious right. to see if there's a parallel thing happening there, too. Oh, that that would be that's actually a potential article idea of a more historical nature. That's 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 a good hypothesis at the very least. But, yeah, I see where you're going with that. And so what I'm simply saying is that one of the stupidest statements I have ever heard in my life in any context, was that, well, America has a free market in professional sports. And I look and have you heard that? This was last week at work because there's a guy oh, who there was there, there was a guy who is kind of like a former high school jock type who has since become a you know a li- little bit do it because he used to be a bully. He actually admitted this to me while we were working. So, but he's actually he's actually kind of okay and he's always treated me well. So I guess maybe he had a personality change. A little bit of a side issue. Point being is that he was very much a jock when he was in high school. So he was very much that stereotype. But one of the but he's also kind of a dumbass. And the stupidest thing I've heard, one of the, I've ever heard anybody say, and this came straight from him, was that I'll say it again because even I had a hard time hearing it the first time. I actually asked him to repeat it, so we'll do that for the listeners here. The claim is America has a free market in professional sports. Okay, no professional sports. I would assume that's major leagues, not minor leagues. Okay, um, and. In context, he was talking about like your NFLs, MLBs and and such. Right. So in context, we were talking major leagues and I looked at him and I also said some things that are not appropriate uh, even for the interwebs. But suffice it to say, uh, he, he, he was basically not not all there and being very delusional. And I guess I guess that would count as controlled schizophrenia too, probably, <laughs> just a little bit. And worse, worse. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Like, the, I think there needs to be a like a different terminology created, different terms created for different stages of controlled schizophrenia, <laughs> like a uh, mild schizo, uh, mild controlled schizo, uh, uh, moderate controlled schizo, and then uh, just uh okay like, i don't know what the the, the worst one would be but uh be or i guess at risk i don't know yeah that, that, um, but yeah, that, i think there needs to be a sliding scale that might that might be a, an episode uh that might be an episode all into itself another podcast for another time but suffice it to say for now that uh yeah yeah prof- yeah for professional uh sports have have competition and it's also oh that's another layer of controlled schizophrenia i just realized is that the whole notion of sports just commonly is about competition between teams whether it's two teams three teams whatever the sport is we could also be playing freaking cricket okay and it would still be a sport right to so just rub in the british a little bit the limey's there a little bit right with cricket um the whole point is competition and play by the rules and fair and the you know the the, the whole notion of fair play and may the best man or in this case team may the best team win but if your competitive teams within a particular sport is actually controlled by a de facto monopoly then we have a contradiction here, at least I think so, or at least a budding contradiction, or at least the great possibility of a contradiction. I mean, unless hypothetically there's supposed to be some sort of alleged competition between, say, different types of professional sports, such as the NFL has more people watching their their games than, let's say, the MLB does. Does that count sure, as competition? Sure, it is. It, I, it, it, it does, yes, but uh, there are... 
it but they're all funded down, by the it, state. It comes down. It comes down to preference, anyways. I mean, uh, you know, just because you know, just. I mean, it's. But they're all funded by the state. Yeah. And oh, by the way, as a side note, without going on too long on this one particular point. You look at the first realm as well. Look at the Olympics, which is more the international version of like professional sports uh, in a sense. And all that stuff's funded by those different uh, nation state governments that are involved with that as well. So you look at the intermingling of the state with different elements of, of culture. Of, well, not just a culture, any culture, really. And you start and again. Take aside the superficialities of like East versus West and different different cultures thereof. Look at the similarities. The similarities are that the state has its grip in the development of culture and social norms. Heck, actually, let me bring up one other thing too. This is more as an issue specific item that political crusaders get big about. Look at marriage. Marriage preexisted the state. Marriage is very much a creation of culture. Originally, you go back far enough, it's a creation of culture. Different Another cultures, one of those different, institutions that we were talking about with the book. Different, different, yeah, different, yeah, different, different peoples, different places, different times, different ethics, different norms. Yes, but still a creation of human culture. Ultimately, objectively, it is. And then the state comes around. Initially, you could say monarchy, but then other forms kind of de- kind of develop from there. Now you have things like marriage licensure, and now and now allegedly in this. Uh, hypothetically enlightened 21st century America, everybody's supposed to be all excited because of the Obergefell decision, which now just extends marriage licensure to homosexuals. And this is, this is progress, quote unquote. How? Marriage licensure originally began, for anybody who understands history, originally began as a form of, uh, of basically penalizing people, penalizing individuals, couples, romantic couples, for engaging in what the state itself called, quote unquote, missegnation. Basically, people with different colored skin uh, copulating together and presumably having families, too. I mean, so how do you go from how do you go from something that wicked and evil to and totally violating the non-aggression principle as an aside to this is now assigned to a now extending said licensure. And now that I mean, that's the as as some as a mark of some sort of human. I mean, that, too, is controlled schizophrenia as well. So what I'm trying to say is that the first realm, when you have that intersection of the of culture and government, you have controlled schizophrenia. You have basically the whole thing becomes hypocritical very fast, very quickly. And there is an undue influence of the one on the other and sometimes even reciprocal. Right, right. The culture, yeah, no, I, I, the, I definitely agree. The culture gave birth to the state. But then even if that were true – the state also changes cultural norms as well, like with militarism and a couple other things. So it's it's very similar to the the no, the Venuan notion of like the servile society where, yes, there is the state, there is government. But then you have these different people in the culture that are – and here's the key word – enabling the state. When you have things like Blue Lives Matter, when you have – Leftist types basically saying, "Pay your taxes, otherwise you're cheating. You're you're cheating on your taxes or whatever." That's that. There's that's all cult. Those are all cultural admonitions. Actually, here's a really good one. I'll, I'll end my rant on. You look back at the 20th century, last century. Every time there was a world war, remember two both world wars happened in the 20th century, at least thus far in human history. The only world wars have been in the 20th century. You look at both world wars. It was actually it wasn't even so much the draft. Of the wars, it was actually the mothers and the women of these so hypothetically enlightened Western cultures that actually shamed and and it wasn't even so much the shaming, it was the it was the pressure, the familial pressure against young men who were of draft age to go up and get blown to bits for the glory of the state. That is the danger of the first realm, is that they use guilt. And they use some other forms of legitimacy not directly tied to the state to, in a circuitous way, legitimize the state's actions. They're, they are – the culture is the enabler of the state's coercion, in other words. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, let's, let's, let's go ahead and – I guess we've kind of uh, already started this, but let's, uh, I guess, officially begin to close out. Uh, I guess I, I guess what I'll say here for this for – this, Introductory episode on the for on the uh, second realm, and I guess in this one, the first realm with uh, with Kyle. 
Um, there is, I mean, I, I can't think of anything positive about the first film. Uh, I really can't. Uh, and, and you know, as, you know, along with that means that I don't see anything uh, good about uh, Western culture or Eastern culture, any culture uh, that whose uh, whose society is based off of uh, uh, force and coercion. Uh, and, and, and I, I do want to reiterate again, uh, which is well, we've been harping on this a lot. And I, I think it's a really, really good thing because I don't hear I mean, there's some discussion on it, but I don't think it goes this, this in depth. Um, but culture is just as important. I mean, the state is is off is obviously evil. Um, there's no doubt about it. But uh, but the culture without a, without a, a subservient culture uh, to go along with it, uh, the, you know, the state would have no power. I mean, if you look at you know Etienne de Le Boetien, uh, uh the I guess uh, the a discourse on voluntary servitude. Uh, you know, if uh, I, and I'm gonna paraphrase badly. Uh, you know, if uh, if if people stopped obeying uh, obeying those in power, uh, you know, the the that would crumble. You know, the the, the state would crumble. So, uh, so yeah, it's culture that uh, I would. I mean, again, you used to kind of the chicken. The, did the chicken come before the egg or or, or whatever? Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but culture 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 definitely empowers the state, uh, and uh, that's uh, I think uh, the the major. The major obstacle for uh, for Venuans or for second realmers uh, is uh, trying to, uh, uh, I guess, first off, withdrawing from that culture and actually pursuing freedom, uh, and then beyond that, uh, avoiding the coercion of the state uh, by also uh, avoiding the uh, the coercion and controlled schizophrenia of those uh, in the first realm. So, yeah, I think that's about all I have. As a conclusionary point, I would just like to bring up the flag. Um, there was that wonderful trilogy you wrote a while back about the flag and the legalities thereof and, and such, mm-hmm. which I encourage everybody to read. Um, but one thing that I think was a good I, – I think at least a decent takeaway was that, yes, you did focus on – at least in the one one article of the three, you did focus on the legalisms and the lawfare – of uh, the Title IV flag code and how like people are like that the patriots of various flavors are like totally committing mass civil disobedience without even realizing it. And of course, mm-hmm. the federal government does not enforce those laws. Not that I am implicitly encouraging them to do so. I'm just simply saying they're not. Therefore, they're hypocrites. Oh shit! I I think they should. Like I, I mean, I don't like the use of force and coercion. But uh, one thing that would completely uh, illegitimize the state is if they started going after people wearing you know American flag shirts. That would be the tipping point. I think I'm kind of being sarcastic. There. Uh, yeah, well, you never know, but uh, but then again, uh, yeah. Considering other forms of oppression and coercion, maybe maybe that would help some people, quote unquote, wake up. Maybe maybe not. But in any case, what I the reason I'm bringing it up here is that the cultural norms regarding the displaying and use of old glory can at times be at odds with what the state in its laws specifically said. So sometimes the culture can kind of win out, even if it's only by default. But then again, consider the flag itself. And also right here in the book on strategy about the use of symbols. The flag is the old glory, the so-called United States flag in its current formulation with 50 stars is actually a symbol first and foremost, besides, of course, literally being a piece of cloth. It is a symbol. Now, what the symbol means, what the value of the symbol is, that's what people get into literal fisticuffs about, like what happened in Portland the other year. You stomp my flag, I'll stomp your face. Right. It's not – now, for people who are more scientific and are more rational, we understand that this is basically a piece of cloth. What those protesters were really getting all – protesty is that a word protesty can i can i coin that protesty anyway what they were getting all protesty over was the symbolism of the flag do you like america do you not like america was the presumption of the symbol even though even though according to the laws and all that it's actually a symbol of the united states federal government but the protesters didn't care about that apparently um it was really more about america presumably with a k uh, and whether you like it or not, and then of course the people burning the flag didn't like America with the K, and the people who were trying to save the flag and not have it touch the ground because reasons um, were of course in favor of America, maybe not necessarily with a K, but at least their version of America, which is apparently some sort of purity of some kind with American exceptionalism, city on a hill, 
um, and so on and so forth. Basically, all these myths, westward expansion, in, 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 in the sense of it being like religiously divine or whatever. Um, it's, it's, it's that kind of thing, more or less. It's, it's Americana, but, with, but like a self-delusionary version of it, which is kind of unfortunate. That, that's kind of what I'm getting at. The protesters were all kind of getting at each other over symbols. And for some reason, some of them thought that the use of force and violence was appropriate when disagreeing with other people to, on the street. To defend those symbols, yeah. To defend the symbols. So neither of them cared about the law, which I thought was interesting because the laws were relevant here. Neither of them cared about the law, but what they did carry about were the cultural – was was the flag as a cultural symbol of something. That's what people really felt very emotional about. Heck, you can even see – actually, speaking about symbols too, just perfect thing to close out on. Look at the whole Confederate statue memorial thing as well as like what, what we in the South would call the stars and bars. Um, that's all symbolism from start to finish. What does it really represent? And notice that the one side usually claims that it's about history and preserving our history, blah, blah, blah. Then the other side is like, well, something, 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 slavery, therefore big, therefore you're being bigoted, right, if you're in favor of the uh, uh, of keeping it on the public land or whatever. And then, of course, both sides completely ignoring that the symbols are on the government land in the first place, and they're not on private property. So they're kind of completely ignoring something that is actually a more – what I think is a more important element of the whole so-called controversy. But notice it's all about symbols. It's not about the actual stone in the memorial, the actual real thing, and it sure is hell ain't about the piece of cloth of the stars and bars, also known as the battle flag of – I think it was Northern Virginia – no, it's not about any of that. It's about well, do, does the, you know does what does the stars and bars mean? What does it symbolize? What uh, you know does does anybody really have a problem with a Robert E. Lee statue? Because ironically, as a side note, Robert E. Lee was actually in favor of abolition, just like Lysander Spooner. It was actually Jefferson Davis who wanted to do the stupid version of well, we'll gradually abolish slavery through cultural assimilation kind of thing. Robert E. Lee actually wanted to abolish slavery immediately. But yeah, people kind of gloss over stuff like that because it's because it's inconvenient to their political goals for well their political crusading. So political crusaders of any flavor have to be disingenuous because history does not fully back them up on much of anything. Because history, actual history shows in some sense shades of gray, but I would say more importantly points I think points out other things which are more important than whatever the limited um, – as a certain Austrian economist who shall go unnamed would put it, the three-by-five card of allowed political debate. And see that's the, that's the problem with the first realm. It's all about putting people in a box and limiting the range of what is allowed to be discussed and even thought about because you have anybody else from, say, shall we say, the second realm that we're trying to build try to go beyond or otherwise outside of that three by five index card. And when we talk about things like cryptocurrencies, or we talk about things like um, canceling voter registration, or we talk about things like assassination oh, politics. Yeah. Anything that, that any form of direct action, really. That's why the people in the first realm really have all sorts of weird emotional reactions. Actually, that itself would be an episode all into itself is all the weird emotional reactions I've come across whenever bringing up direct action of any kind, whether self-defensive or, or, uh, or, or of something else. I mean it's, it's like this range of how dare you basically spit in the face of reformism, really? How dare you spit in the face of political crusading? I mean, it's really quite volatile. I mean, I knew I knew it was already kind of risky in one sense, but uh, to kind of directly confront people and say like, hey, why don't you go live off grid or why don't you go freelance if you don't like your job, you know, financial – one route of financial independence. Why don't you you know, do something like a real alternative? Not saying it works equally for everybody. I'm just saying, have you considered it? Even bringing it up in casual conversation is walk. At least for me, at least here in in the Austin area, is really walking up a hill, quite a bit, uh, so to speak. And it's kind of unfortunate that, I mean, I know like the Austin, Texas area has has historically been very leftist, but I would have assumed that maybe some of them would be dare shall we say progressive in the sense of not being closed minded. Oh, uh, that's not true. They're only open-minded about superficial. No. They're only open-minded about superficial things like social justice. 
when it comes to anything that actually truly matters, things that are fundamentals, things that actually look not just at identity politics, but more importantly, at I- real identity itself, like I was getting at earlier with the identity documents and so forth that are issued by bureaucrats. Holy God, they freak out and act like conservatives. The, the reactions are absolutely fascinating. At least the conservatives I talk to that are very much part of the first realm, at least when they get in my face and tell me how much of a traitor to my country I am, their words, not mine. At least they're in my face and have the honesty to tell me what they really think of me. The leftist types don't do that, at least not as much, because they want to preserve some thin veneer of, of oh, we, we, can go, we can get along kind of thing. At least the conservatives are just straight up, you know, go to hell, dude. <laughs> They're just straight up authoritarian. They're, they just, they, I mean, they don't go give a crap, at least the ones I've come across. But yeah, the first realm does have people with differing uh, psychological dispositions, I suppose. But the similarities are where it's at. You know, the nation state is God. You must pay your taxes. You mu- you w- must never disobey your God by, you know, I mean, like, what's agorism? That's uh, that's basically good people disobeying unjust laws. And the whole point of a second realm is to provide a layer of protection of private property borders for people who want to be outside that first realm, regardless of whether it's legal or not. Legality doesn't even come into it. It can be gray market, it can be black market, doesn't matter. It's an ethical enclave, what else can I say? So that's that's the philosophy of the first realm. It's all about force. And, and, you know, it, it's all about the initiation of force and legitimized monopoly coercion. <laughs>